Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first debate of the 2022 China Power Conference. So this is our first uh, large in-person meeting since COVID, so we're really delighted that we have so many of you here joining us in person. We actually weren't sure how many people would show up in person because of both COVID concerns, but also because of the t uh, the relatively cold weather, but we really appreciate you joining here with us. And I also know we have a number of folks also joining us online. So I'm Bonnie Lin, Director of the China Power Project at CSIS and Senior Fellow for Asian Security. So this is our seventh annual China Power Conference, and as typical with our conferences, we feature leading experts to debate and discuss critical topics. So this year's conference, we, we'll, we'll, we'll be splitting it up into several different events and days. So this is our first event, uh, first half day, and we'll likely be having a part two, uh, I think currently scheduled for January 24th, but stay tuned. And we may also have some of our debates online. So today we're covering two topics, Taiwan and China, Russia two issues that no one pays attention to these days. So we're really gl glad that you're joining us. But before we turn to our debate, we had the opportunity to invite um, a, a, a key leader to deliver remarks for us. He wanted to join us in person, but he was not able to. So he kindly re pre-recorded some remarks for us. And that's uh, Senator Ed Markey um, uh, from Massachusetts. He was elected to the Senate in 2013, and he chairs the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee on East Asia, the Pacific, and International Cybersecurity Policy. So let's first play his remarks. Um, unfortunately, since he's not joining us in person, there will not be any Q&A, but we, I've talked to our two very leading experts here on Taiwan, and they're willing to uh, allow for more time for questions from their panel, and I'm sure there will be a lot of questions and discussions on Taiwan. So with that, again, thank you for joining us, and let's uh, play the Senator's keynote remarks. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Senator Ed Markey from Massachusetts, the Chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee on East Asia and the Pacific. I'm pleased to join you today to discuss a critical foreign policy topic for the United States and challenges and opportunities presented by China. It's a very important discussion. I'm sure there will be a lively debate on the most pressing questions from the likelihood of a crisis over Taiwan to China's relationship with Russia. So let me take the opportunity to frame this conversation with my view from Congress. Most people know me as co-author of the Green New Deal or a stalwart opponent of nuclear proliferation and leader of the nuclear freeze movement. In short, a progressive activist in the body of a longtime legislator. As the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee on East Asia and the Pacific, I have spent much of the last few years thinking about how we bring the values and energy of the progressive climate movement to issues of foreign policy. Just as we face an existential crisis from climate change, we also face an existential crisis from militant authoritarianism the aggression, abuses, and inequality embraced by leaders like Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin pose challenges of the same magnitude as the climate crisis to a progressive foreign policy. One thing the United States and the West have been slow to learn is that when strongmen like Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping tell us what they plan to do, we have to believe them. Following the Chinese Communist Party Congress last month, we know more about Xi Jinping's plans. China is doubling down on authoritarianism at home and abroad, supporting Russia's aggression in Ukraine, retaining an aggressive policy towards Taiwan, and maintaining coal in its domestic energy supply. Clearly, this is not a simple challenge. To rise to this challenge, the United States needs to recognize several overlapping realities. First, we are not in a new Cold War with China, but we must be clear-eyed about the Chinese government's intentions. Second, we must act alongside our partners and allies to protect our own interests and values, which includes operating with China, cooperating with them where necessary 
And third, we must do all of this while ensuring that we avoid unnecessary provocative actions with little reward and keep lines of communication open to avoid deadly miscalculations. A direct military conflict between two nuclear armed powers would be an existential threat to humanity. President Biden's meeting earlier this week with Xi Jinping demonstrates the importance of keeping communications open. And I support the President's moves to set up mechanisms for cabinet officials to engage directly with their Chinese government counterparts to resolve all issues. To achieve these goals, the United States needs to continue to build a coalition of like-minded countries ready to push back against the worst abuses of the Chinese government and increase our engagement in the region, not just militarily, but also diplomatically and economically. China intends to build its regional economic and military power and push back against international norms and agreements that protect territorial integrity, human rights, and free speech. We have to take these plans very seriously. In 2018, Senator Cory Gardner and I partnered to pass the Asia Reassurance Initiative Act, a comprehensive bill that invested $1.5 billion in Asia-Pacific region at a time when most of D.C.'s focus was elsewhere. This increased U.S. investment in the region, and it couldn't have come at a more important moment in time. Today, we need to redouble our efforts to, and increase our presence in the Asia-Pacific. When I traveled to the region this summer, I was overwhelmingly clear uh, that the countries wanted the United States to be present, but also that they want us to engage in bilateral and regional relationships on their own terms, not just through the lens of China. It was equally vital that we push back on regional and global efforts by the Chinese government to export authoritarianism and weaken norms and institutions. As long as the Chinese government uses technology and intellectual property to commit human rights abuses, undertakes mass surveillance, and encroaches on international territory, we have to take steps to protect U.S. national security as well as international norms built on universal values. To that end, I have been vocal and pushing back against the most egregious Chinese government actions. From Xinjiang to Hong Kong, I have fought hard to support human rights and call out the Chinese government's abuses, and I will continue to do so. I have also not been quiet about China's pro provo uh, provocations surrounding Taiwan. China's actions undermine peace and stability across Taiwan Strait. This past summer, I traveled to Taipei to evaluate the situation firsthand. The trip underscored what should be a touchstone of our Taiwan policy, that if there is a military attack on Taiwan, it will be those living in Taiwan who will bear the brunt of the consequences. Therefore, we need to be intentional about the risks we take when crafting U.S. policy and ensure that risks have a tangible reward for Taiwan's security. The world should know that it's the Chinese government aiming to change the status quo in Taiwan, not the United States government, and not Taiwan. Xi Jinping's temper tantrum after Mai and Speaker Pelosi's visits to Taiwan, visits that have a long history of precedent, demonstrated clearly that he is the one attempting to change the expectations around Taiwan. In Congress, we should focus on deterring China from unilaterally changing the status quo of Taiwan by military force. We should do this by putting Taiwan in the strongest position possible to defend itself. And we should make sure that our allies and partners in the region and around the world know that we are committed to Taiwan's self-defense and to doing everything we can to avoid conflict over Taiwan. What we should not do is take actions that put Taiwan at increased risk with little reward, and instead we should focus on tangible actions like legislation that my bipartisan Taiwan Fellowship Act, which would enhance people-to-people -people ties between the United States and Taiwan, as well as taking steps to support Taiwan's self-defense. We have a moral responsibility to stand up to authoritarianism and military aggression. 
We also have a moral responsibility to do everything we can to avoid a situation that could draw two nuclear armed countries into a conflict. Diplomacy must remain central to our Taiwan policy and to our engagement with the Chinese government. This is why I'm glad to see President Biden and Xi Jinping agree to keep the lines of communication open and to plan for Secretary Blinken to visit China. While we manage areas on which we disagree, we should also look for challenges uh, where we can leverage the power of diplomacy. China burns more coal than the rest of the world combined and emits the most carbon emissions of any nation on Earth, more than double that of the United States. To make the progress we need on climate change, the United States and China must engage and challenge each other to, to enact ambitious and lasting policies as soon as possible. I'm pleased that the United States and China will restart climate negotiations. We don't have a moment to waste. We've taken a crucial step in the United States with the passage of the historic Inflation Reduction Act, which is projected to set the United States on track to reduce emissions by 40 percent from 2005 levels in 2030. This brings the United States significantly closer to meeting its nationally determined contribution at the Paris Climate Agreement. We need China to do its part as well through renewed discussions with China and in concert with our partners and allies, we must push China closer to achieving its climate pledges and contribute to loss and damage funds. We can't afford rising tempers from China when we have rising temperatures around the globe. We need cooperation. These are areas where we must cooperate, but we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Working with China on issues like tackling climate crisis does not mean we can't have difficult conversations or hold the Chinese government to account for its worst abuses. President Biden's national security strategy echoed this approach. Just as we must prioritize tackling the climate crisis in our relationship with China, so too must we remember that much of our economy is impacted by China. Good foreign policy must center on the economic needs of Americans, especially American workers. The Biden administration from day one has been focused on bringing manufacturing back home and decreasing our reliance on foreign supply chains, supply chains that have already been hobbled by Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. I am committed to working with the administration to ramp up domestic manufacturing, and protect national security. That is why Congress passed the CHIPS Act to make sure that the United States does not have to rely on foreign manufacturing for these critical goods and to invest in more efficient, sustainable chips that are essential to power next generation technologies. In a relationship as complicated as ours with China, we must remain constantly vigilant about making a costly or even unthinkable error. While I believe that President Biden's nuclear posture review missed important opportunities to lower nuclear tensions with China, for example, by failing to renounce the first use of nuclear weapons in a conflict, it is encouraging that the administration has kept the door open to risk reduction with China. To put it plainly, we must avoid a nuclear war, but this cannot be a one-sided endeavor. Sixty years after the Cuban Missile Crisis, we are still at risk of nuclear recklessness from Moscow and other actors. Torn and frayed as the architecture of nuclear arms control may be, the long history of risk reduction measures with Russia has helped keep lines of communication in place at important moments during Russia's unprovoked war on Ukraine. No comparable architecture has ever been developed between the United States and China, however, and it's well past time for us to start. And that's why I introduced bipartisan legislation, such as the Taiwan Assure Act, which seeks to lower the risk of conflict in the Taiwan Strait by supporting dialogues to mitigate misunderstandings, promoting transparency, establishing a crisis hotline between the United States and China. And I'm far from finished 
as co-chair of the Congressional Nuclear Weapons and Arms Control Working Group, I will continue to push for measures that reduce the specter of nuclear weapons, something we urgently need to prioritize at a time when China is increasing its nuclear arsenal. These are the types of investments the United States needs to make in order to prioritize stability and avoid conflict, to be clear-eyed about China, advance our interests and values, and avoid disastrous miscalculations. It's a tall order. However, we are fortunate to have partners and allies around the world who are willing and able to work with us, not just because of shared concerns about the Chinese government's intentions and actions, but because of our shared interests and values. We must build on that. And while President Biden has rebuilt our partnerships from the wreckage left by the Trump administration, we can do better. A successful China policy requires the United States to reinvest in our relationships with other countries around the world. We need to build relationships, make economic investments, and provide foreign assistance across the world, but especially in the Asia Pacific. We can and we should do so purely on the merits of building strong relationships, but this will have the added effect of offering an alternative to the corrupt authoritarian debt trap diplomacy of the Chinese government. Yet, we can engage with our partners and allies around the world simply to get ahead of China. Countries are looking for true long-term commitments from the United States. We need to value bilateral relationships on their own merit, not simply through the lens of competition. President Biden's increased engagement with the Pacific Islands is one example of how we should approach these long-term investments. As chairman of the East Asia and Pacific Subcommittee, on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, I have prioritized building up our alliances, strengthening people-to-people -people ties, and tackling the existential crisis of climate change and nuclear weapons, which threaten millions of people around the world, particularly in the Asia-Pacific region. This is a difficult moment. Authoritarians around the world are betting that democracy is weak. We know and their people know that their systems are rotten with corruption, brutality, and censorship. The United States must continue to protect our interests, promote universal values, and make clear that we do not seek war or conflict. That is our responsibility. Yes, we need to project strength, but strength is not limited to military might. There is strength in pursuing paths that avoid unnecessary conflict and seek to address our shared challenges. To paraphrase Winston Churchill, to jaw jaw is always better than to war war. Thank you for your time. Marky, for these very comprehensive remarks on both how to understand China, the challenges we face with respect to competition with China, and also, of course, the need to continue to cooperate with China on issues like climate change. So for this conference right now, for at least for this portion of the conference, we are, I think, fo focusing more on the challenges of China. So with that, uh, I would like to kick off our first debate. Uh, the proposition for this debate, as you may have seen online, is China's new normal of increased military activities in the Taiwan Strait is likely to lead to a U.S.-China or China-Taiwan crisis or conflict in the next year or two. This past August, the Chinese PLA conducted unprecedented military exercises near Taiwan. These exercises held in response to Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan included missile tests near Taiwan's waters and routine crossings of Taiwan's Strait median line. Some have begun to consider China's increased military exercises around Taiwan as a new normal that will feature routine and aggressive exercises by the PLA. So this morning's proposition, before we actually have our um, experts debate this, I would like to get your votes on, uh, on this issue. So to vote, uh, you, you can see here, you can either vote online through the website, or if you're here in person, you can text 2233, and then you text China Power to 223, one word. 
And after you uh, text that, you'll see a poll th come out. Uh, you'll see a response of a poll. And if you agree with this proposition, you text A. If you disagree, you text B. So let me just give everyone a minute to figure out how to do that on your phone. I would really appreciate those, particularly in the audience, if you could uh, do this poll, because we did a poll on Twitter, but I think it's also very indicative the day of to see how folks actually view this, particularly those watching the discussion. Okay, so as we're giving time for folks to, uh, to vote, let me, um, let me introduce our, uh, our two speakers. So arguing for this proposition is uh, Mr. John K. Culver, non-resident senior fellow with the Atlantic Council's Global China Hub and former, former Central Intelligence Agency senior intelligence officer. Mr. Culver has 35 years of experience as a leading analyst of East Asian affairs, including security, economic, and foreign policy dimensions. Arguing against this proposition is Dr. Alexander Huang, Chairman and CEO of the Council on Strategic and Wargaming Studies and Special Advisor to the Chairman and Director of International Affairs of the Kuomintang Party, KMT. Dr. Huang previously served in the Taiwan government as Deputy Minister of the Mainland Affairs Council and has worked closely with consecutive governments on foreign and security policy matters. So thanks to both John and Alexander for joining us today. Uh, but before the debate, let's share the results of the live poll. So I think uh, the poll results show that uh, John has a strong case that he needs to make. Uh, it seems about 70%, 68% of those listening right now seem to agree that we're not going to see a crisis or conflict in the Taiwan Strait in the next year or two, at least not caused by the new normal of increased military activities. Uh, Hannah, if you could also show the polling that we did on Twitter. Uh, I think this poll was on Twitter for three days, so a little bit more time, which showed the results were a little bit more uh, evenly spread. 46% agreed that there, we might see a crisis or conflict, and about 55% uh, disagreed. So again, John, you have a harder, uh, you're arguing for the harder position. So maybe uh, to give perhaps John as well as Andrew, Alexander more time, let me turn the floor to John now for uh, your initial opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you. I like a challenge. Nowhere to go but up. Um, I want to thank CSIS and the China Power Project and especially Bonnie Lin for hosting this event. It's a pleasure to debate Alexander on this vital topic. First, uh, I'll bend the rules uh, slightly by redefining the pro debate proposition. Uh, the new normal of increased Chinese military activities is a symptom rather than the cause of momentum toward crisis or conflict in the next year or two. I see little evidence China has a fixed timeline and agenda for compelling Taiwan, whether based on some assumptions that as soon as the PLA is ready, China will launch an invasion, or that the Communist Party will launch an opportunistic war to shore up uh, domestic legitimacy. None of this is true in terms of China's goals, its view of the usefulness of military force or how the Communist Party's legitimacy has been trending or is likely to trend um, over the next decade. But the frequency of US senior military and national security officials asserting this, that there is a risk of war in the near term, underscores just how dangerous this situation has become. War isn't the plan for the Communist Party of China which has been executing a strategy to achieve eventual reunification for decades, primarily through non-military means. One of the things that U.S. folks seem to miss is that we, we frame this as though China has a military strategy for Taiwan. In fact, China has a political, economic, information, uh, cyber, and counterintelligence strategy, which has a military component, not the reverse. Instead, the real danger is that all of the factors that tended to preserve the status quo since China, U.S. China diplomatic recognition in 1979 have eroded and are likely to continue to erode. These include the military balance, which has swung decisively in China's favor across the Taiwan Strait, but also in, many ways, in many ways that military balance is the least consequential change in and of itself because even now, China is not building an invasion fleet. 
The more destabilizing factors driving the dynamic are, first, Taiwan's domestic political and identity development, where even the Kuomintang would pay a political cost to sustain its prior position on the 1992 consensus. Domestic sentiment on Taiwan is turning even more strongly against any form of unification under any timeline. Second, the emergence of full-blown U.S.-China strategic rivalry, which increases Taiwan's attraction to both major U.S. political parties as a litmus test of standing up to China. There's a myth that the main constraint against Taiwan independence has been the threat of Chinese military action. At least since the mid-1990s, the main constraint against more independence-focused policies and election outcomes on Taiwan has been pressure on Taipei from Washington. We are much more incentivized today and looking forward to play the Taiwan card due to our own bipartisan political dynamic than because of actions by even an explicitly pro-independence leader in Taipei, which President Tsai is not. China, finally, third, China's own emergence is a great power, with clear military dominance over Taiwan and seeming parity versus the United States. The Communist Party no longer has the excuse of not reacting violently to provocations because it is weak. Consider how China responded after the accidental U.S.-NATO bombing of their embassy in Belgrade in 1999. Um, China understood that it did not have the means to respond proportionally, so it responded through other measures. Um, those days are gone. China is no longer weak. Chinese domestic public opinion has grown more nationalistic as strategic rivalry with the U.S. has played out, and China has realized many of its great power ambitions. The core of the problem is that the United States, China, and Taiwan confront, that we confront can be seen from the 50-year-old position, carefully wordsmithed then to acknowledge the PRC and ROC views in 1972, found in the Shanghai Communique which still serves as the bedrock of U.S.-China relations. I'll just quote briefly, uh, not terrorize Bonnie here. The United States acknowledges that all Chinese on either side of the Taiwan Strait maintain there is but one China and that Taiwan is a part of China. The United States government does not challenge that position. It reaffirms its interest in a peacetime settlement of the Taiwan question by the Chinese themselves. Today, the people, or a majority of the people on one side of the Taiwan Strait, do not consider themselves Chinese. And a significant majority of the people of Taiwan no longer maintain that Taiwan is a part of China. So the momentum toward crisis is structural and building, but crisis and even conflict doesn't mean invasion. China has full spectrum capabilities to pressure and drive a coercive dynamic. It was prepared in 2008 to kill people, destroy much of Taiwan's Navy Air Force infrastructure and deter or blunt U.S. intervention to punish or teach a lesson and satisfy Chinese domestic nationalistic domestic opinion. This is not the Communist Party or the PLA's first rodeo. As was evident even before Speaker Pelosi's August visit to Taiwan, the situation is again becoming militarized. Militarization means redefining major aspects of the status quo, not persistent crisis. The PLA is already doing this with daily flights and naval operations in the Taiwan Strait over the median line. They did it again today with 21 aircraft up and about half of which then crossed the median line, both uh, mostly in the southwest uh, quadrant. It can ratchet this up and down and when provoked by Taipei or Washington, or Washington, shift the lines even further, including by putting Taiwan to the U.S. in a position to shoot first and take responsibility for escalation. China has been working for 10 years to harden the Communist Party, the Chinese economy, the military, its technological base, and for the past few years through its dual circulation policies, insulate itself against sanctions and resource constraints. It may not be ready for war, but it is better prepared for a crisis over Taiwan than it was just a few years ago. It's also, as the Department of Defense noted last year, massively expanding its nuclear forces to enhance its deterrent capability. When I started as an analyst at CIA uh, more years ago than I'd like to admit, China had about a dozen and a little bit more of ICBMs that could reach the United States. Today it has about 150. By the end of the decade, it will have 1,000 nuclear warheads, most of them mounted on ICBMs capable of ranging the United States. Many of the understandings, military factors, and ambiguous positions that enabled decades of peace, prosperity, and democracy on Taiwan are now eroding. Due to China's economic and military power, Taiwan's consolidating democracy led by the pro-autonomy DPP, 
and burgeoning U.S. determination to play the Taiwan card in its strategic rivalry with China. Despite the subdued U.S. reaction to China's unprecedented military response to Speaker Pelosi's visit, the United States and Taiwan have turned the page. Denying China a crisis it wanted showed how far China could go without risking war. Very far indeed. Beijing now has a better sense of how to press further in the face of new provocations, both to avoid escalation or to put the onus on Washington and the United States for a conflict that results. A Chinese decision to use military force is conditions-based, and it has been relatively clear for decades, as that has been clear for rel relatively clear for decades, um, depending on the actions by Taiwan and the United States that would cause military conflict. More recently, the United States, which previously seemed to understand this, appears to now subscribe to a belief that China's use of force is just a matter of time. This creates a dynamic for serious crisis or war. Whether U.S. actions create the conditions for a war it nominally seeks, where U.S. actions create the conditions for a war that it nominally seeks to deter. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, so, Alexander, over to you for your opening comments. Well, good morning. Uh, it's glad to be back at CSIS where I worked. Uh, in the late 1990s. Uh, I'm also very happy to uh, have my distinguished friend John Culver to appear with me in this debate. And uh, thank you, Bonnie, and uh, the China Power team uh, to set up this year's program. Uh, before starting my argument, uh, like John, I uh, uh, also wanted to make several clarifications on the uh, proposition. First, uh, I'm here today as a long-term uh, China watcher um, uh, and not as a uh, KMT representative in the United States. Uh, and my view presented here should not be attributed to the position of my party. Secondly, uh, I participate in this debate for the purpose of exploiting a critical security issue that is so important to the governments and people of the United States and Taiwan. I'm not here to defend or criticize the policy positions of uh, current governments in Washington, Taipei, or Beijing, or the general public sentiments uh, in the three countries. To me, this may not be a debate, but a mental exercise to share different angles of looking at this critical issue. Three, I, we all know that there, there are great uncertainties uh, in the analysis of strategic competition between the United States and China. And we also understand that professional assessment or debate on current affairs can only be done based on a certain level of rationality. So today we are not uh, in a blaming game or a guessing game. Uh, there are two elements that help me to frame uh, the construct of the issue. First, crisis or conflict may carry a different meaning to different people. If we name the Chinese military exercises between July 1995 and March 1996 uh, as the Taiwan Strait Missile Crisis, can we call the EP3 incident near Hainan Island in 2001 a conflict or a crisis? So I, wanted, I would not count a one-time unintended incident without further escalation as a conflict. Second, for the purpose of analysis and elaboration, I would focus my discussion on the timeline of the next two years before the United States presidential election in November uh, 2024. In today's debate, I uh, take the position against the proposition. Uh, I recall that when Bonnie reached me um, many, several months ago and asked me if I wanted to uh, participate in this debate and I have a priority choice 
um, I immediately responded by choosing uh, the B or the position against the proposition. And here are the arguments for my uh, positions uh, under three different levels. The strategy level, the operational level, and decision makers level. At the strategic level, um, I make several points. First, maintaining peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait is in the interest of all parties. In the Indo-Pacific region, and has been the policy uh, of the United States. I mean, maintaining peace and stability. According to a news report, uh, in the virtual meeting in March this year and uh, the site meeting during the G20 uh, a, few years, uh, a few days ago, President Biden has expressed that the United States does not seek to get into a new Cold War with China, does not seek to change the Chinese political system, does not seek to strengthen alliance against China, does not support Taiwan independence, and has no intention of getting into conflict with China. In Taiwan, uh, decades of public opinion polls have shown the massive majority support of the status quo, i.e. Uh, no unification, no independence, and no war. Even though the current DPP government does not recognize the 1992 consensus and suffers the absence of communication lines with Beijing, it has continued to claim the status quo as the official policy. Three, uh, despite the growing voice inside China calling for the use of force to resolve the political differences across the Taiwan Strait, and Beijing has never renounced the military option against a possible de jure independence of Taiwan. The Chinese government and uh, Xi Jinping have maintained the peaceful unification, quote unquote, as the primary policy toward Taiwan as of today. In addition, with overwhelming diplomatic and economic leverage, Beijing has been able to expand the items in its toolbox to be used to coerce Taiwan into unification talks without applying force. Beyond the above mentioned uh, base policies, the international reactions to the Russian invasion would also provide the Chinese uh, Communist Party and military decision makers with lessons to learn in their thinking of military actions against Taiwan and the United States. In addition, the presidential elections in Taiwan in January 2024 and in the United States in November 2024 could bring tractions to a military conflict in the Taiwan Strait. A military conflict before January 2024 uh, may disrupt and possibly lead to a cancellation of the election in Taiwan and extended the DPP administration in power. And this is a factor that China needs to think about. And a military conflict in the Taiwan Strait between January 2024 and, um, and November 2024 may generate both Republican and Democratic candidates in a contest of anti-China campaigns and make the great power competition more unpredictable. Now I'm turning to the operational level. Also several points. First, China has not engaged in a local war for 43 years since the so-called punitive war against Vietnam in 1979, and Taiwan for 64 years since the second Taiwan Strait crisis in 1958. The two untested militaries and people with no real experience in the conduct of modern warfare are very dangerous and run a high risk of unwanted process and results. And that must be a key concern to leaders and generals and admirals of all parties. Second, escalation control of any military conflict 
will be very challenging for everyone involved. No one can ensure that horizontal and vertical escalation can be well managed before an accident occurs. History has presented cases where unwanted war may take place due to unexpected small incidents and that can add extra caution to leaders and war planners today. Uh, understand that escalation control relies on sound command controlling communications on all sides, and that's not easy. But if the risk of an unwanted war is very high, all parties should pay more attention to tight control over their military activities, as we have witnessed uh, in the past several months uh, in the Taiwan Strait. Both China and the United States are nuclear powers, no matter uh, the large gap in nuclear arsenals, uh, the escalation to a nuclear exchange between China and the United States will bring uh, a global disaster. Number three, a point that I specifically want to make, uh, prudency and caution in warfare, or in Mandarin Chinese, and waging wars under a righteous cause, or in Mandarin Chinese, have been embedded in Chinese military culture. Students of Chinese military affairs must remember that Chairman Mao has also insisted that one should not fight a war without certainty. Disregard, disregarding Washington's policy of strategic ambiguity and strategic clarity in its war games and operations planning. Beijing has always assumed that the United States will intervene in the military conflict in the Taiwan Strait. That will definitely be in China's calculation of a Taiwan contingency. Now I'll turn to a decision maker level. Two points. First, Xi Jinping's further consolidation of his power in the eyes of many may introduce, uh, may induce a military adventure in the Taiwan Strait. But a more confident Xi Jinping may also believe that time is on Beijing's side. And with his extended term in power, he does not need to get into a military conflict over Taiwan before November 2024. Second point, there are two publications by the Chinese Central Military Commission. The first one is called Study Outline of the Xi Jinping Strong Military Thought, or Xi Jinping Qiangjun Sishang Xue Xi Gang Yao. And the second one, Q&A for the Learning of Xi Jinping Strong Military Thought, or in Mandarin Chinese, Xi Jinping Qiangjun Sishang Xue Xi Wen Da. Both books had caught my eyes and provided evidence that Xi Jinping believes that there are major deficiencies of the People's Liberation Army in the conduct of a modern high-tech warfare. I believe that Xi Jinping's priority is to maintain his personal power in high position as long as possible, is to maintain the Communist Party's control of one party rule in China, is to fulfill the dream, the Chinese dream of the grand rejuvenation of a Chinese nation. Maybe for this reason, Xi Jinping is likely to struggle against elements that may delay, derail, or destroy the Chinese dream. A military crisis or conflict will not for, work for that priority that Xi Jinping wants. Christopher Johnson provides his observation in why China will play it safe. Jessica Chen Weiss also wrote that the growing fatalism of some commentators neglects the interest of the United States, China, Taiwan, and the world 
all shared in avoiding a shooting war. Yesterday, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Mark Milley, said, I think it would be unwise, it would be a political mistake, a geopolitical mistake, a strategic mistake, similar to what the strategic mistake that Putin has made in Ukraine. And I believe Xi Jinping understand that. Finally, I wanted to say that tension can be reduced, a crisis can be avoided if we maintain the communication channels open, if we balance military readiness and preventive diplomacy, and if we do not fall into the trap or vicious cycle between overreach and overreaction. Thank you. Uh, I want to now turn the floor to John for uh, any rebuttals or initial thoughts you have. Obviously, a rich set of remarks and comments to uh, address. Thank you. Uh, it was an impressive presentation by Alexander, unfortunately for me. Um, but I would ask, though, you, you ended on an optimistic note. Um, and I have a hard time sort of seeing optimism because the things you prescribe of increasing communications, especially between, I, I assume, Washington and Beijing, um, an increase in use of diplomacy and avoiding overreaction or over, uh, overreach, um, I think then things would have to change in the current U.S.-China dynamic for those to be factors that actually add to stability. Um, my personal view, stepping out of sort of debate, debate persona, is um, perhaps the Biden-Xi meeting at, uh, in Bali is, is a, a floor on the decline of the relationship. Um, but I see sort of two, folk, two, two adversaries who have stopped digging but are still leaning on their shovels. Um, and some of the actions that US, the U.S. Congress, some in the U.S. Congress would like to bring would bring in the power equipment to uh, dig even deeper, faster. Um, so I think that something would have to change in order to move toward this more optimistic setting given the trajectory, trajectory that we're on. Um, as I noted in my opening remarks, that to me the dynamic driving the risk of crisis or war um, isn't uh, really uh, China's military buildup or its actions in the Taiwan Strait. It's the decline of the U.S.-China condominium that really served as the main break for most of the last 40 years. Um, so that, those are my, my main thoughts in hearing your presentation. Yeah, John, uh, you know, we, we have known each other for a long time, and, uh, and I pretty much agree with the general observation and assessment that, um, you know, the Biden-Xi Jinping meeting in uh, Bali, Indonesia, uh, might be uh, on the section or part of optimism. Um, you know, um, if we wanted to see that the summit uh, lay a floor uh, that preventing the continual fall of the bilateral relationship, um, I guess most people in town, especially, uh, you know, uh, academics or think tank, you know, specialists, would still have some questions in mind. You know, because the debate de defines that uh, there, whether if there will be a crisis or conflict occurring. But the real challenge for people like us or people, most people in this town, is how to prevent it. Um, there are tons of work to do uh, we, we have no reason to be terribly optimistic about the bilateral relationship between the United States and China. Because we all know that uh, there are uh, you know, certain level of stability uh, in Chinese decision making because it's a one man show. But that's also the source of problem because we um, uh, we don't know, or the Chinese decision-making process, especially uh, for now, after COVID, after uh, decoupling, after the trade war, after we cease exchange. 
um, the, the process in Beijing became, becomes very opaque for any of us who are trying to figure out you know, what would be the right way to do our assessment and reasonable enough that we ourselves would believe in. And that's the challenge. Of course, uh, for the position that I hold, uh, I have to be optimistic. But, but the, optimist, the optimism would, be, would have to be based on hard work. You know, it's how hard to have a summit. We all know that. We were in the government before. It takes hours, days, months of tough negotiations and fighting word by words. Um, and this time, um, uh, we do not have a joint uh, you know, statement between the two leaders. But if they were working on a joint statement, probably that will take another month or so to reach uh, the agreed version. So, um, and I think our, our best uh, bet is that how to, based on our existing knowledge or accumulated understanding of the other side, and, and try, to, try to find the best possible way to inform our decision maker that what would be the right course to do to avoid conflict. Because we heard from the senator this morning and we heard from every quarters that talking on one hand that we wanted to prevent war, we want to avoid conflict. But on the, but on the other hand, we are drafting bills and doing things and try to push uh, and, and that, that made uh, a lot of our Asian Pacific neighbors nervous. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a very tough period of time that we all uh, situated in. I think, uh, I guess my takeaway from this discussion debate so far is that neither of you believe that China intends to start a major crisis or a major conflict uh, against Taiwan in the next year or two. But please correct me if that's wrong. Well, as I said, in mine, um, I don't think China or Xi Jinping has a timeline for um, compelling unification or use of force. I think, though, that there, as I said in my presentation, it's conditions-based. And uh, the U.S. long accepted this, that China has been very clear about its red lines, which is an assertion by Taiwan of full independence from China, and especially international recognition of that. Um, secondly, if Taiwan were to acquire the means uh, to build nuclear weapons, I think that would be a red line. And Taiwan twi tr tried twice um, earlier in the 70s and 80s to acquire nuclear weapons. Both times they were detected and shut down by the United States, not by China. Um, and third would be if Taiwan, the situation on Taiwan became ungovernable, if there were um, large unrest. China has also sometimes touched on if there's a major presence of foreign forces uh, on Taiwan that it could constitute a causes belli. Um, and in my view, if, if, if those conditions are not met, China is willing to continue to pursue unification through non-military means. Which, you know, the, the thing, the problem with the term status quo is implies things have been in stasis. Things have been incredibly dynamic, especially over the last 20 years. Um, China has been pursuing unification through economic integration, through people-to-people exchanges across the strait. Prior to the pandemic, there were estimates or guesstimates of two million Taiwanese living in mainland China, mostly working in Chinese industries and electronics and other fields. And similarly, before the pandemic, there were upwards of a million, a million and a half Chinese visitors to Taiwan every year. Um, so you, you, had, you had all of these robust conditions that gave Beijing a reason to be patient, that these other conditions at least had the potential, if not the actuality, of building the possibility of uh, a political resolution to the Chinese Civil War from their perspective. Um, it's a lot harder to see that today, partly because of the pandemic, the end of travel, um, sanctions on Chinese industry, new sanctions on semiconductor components that could reduce Taiwan's economic integration. Uh, with China. So uh, I think the glue that had been holding this together is starting to fray. Yeah, um, I would, uh, you know, I basically I agreed uh, John's assessment, uh, but I wanted to focus more on more t 
you know, recent topic or, or recent event. Um, in this particular uh, period of time, when both Washington and Beijing are talking about red lines, and some people said red line is very thin, and some people said it's one mile width, and so you can still have flexibilities on the line. And do we have a, you know, actually after the summit, do we, are we more comfortable than before the summit that the red line is clear? That may be the work that we need to find out in the next few days or in weeks. Uh, but, but, but in this uh, exchange, that how Beijing would insist and how the United States would respond to Beijing's insistence uh, would be an indicator for many. The people are watching, not in this town, but also in all major capital cities in Asia Pacific. Uh, that is one thing. The other is that, you know, if we uh, recall, um, you know, the Wall Street Journal said that immediately after uh, uh, the August uh, Speaker Pelosi's visit and the August drill, uh, the White House started uh, to reach out Beijing and started to plan this, uh, you know, leadership summit. But if we review the uh, flying route of Speaker Pelosi, you know, from Malaysia to tai Taiwan, <laughs> And, and also check with the navigation uh, route of U.S.'s Ronald Reagan. You know, that, you know, without any inside story, that will lead us to think whether it was based on a tacit understanding to avoid the, a conflict, or it could be a kind of conversation that occurred before that. Because... You know, there were four months at least uh, from April to August uh, for Speaker Pelosi's visit. You know, as a person living in Taiwan, uh, I'm, I'm still thinking, you know, whether the new Speaker of the House would have a plan to uh, visit Taiwan again. And, um, and knowing that uh, the August drill planner is now the vice chairman of the Central Military Commission in Beijing and how he would react. Uh, so we got a lot of work to do. Uh, it, it, you know, I do, still do not believe that uh, um, Beijing and Washington intentionally to inflict or ignite uh, a conflict. Uh, but there are communication lines uh, between uh, indo PECOM, I guess, uh, or Washington and Beijing. The only downside, uh, I'll finish after this remark uh, at this point. The, the only thing missing that I feel uncomfortable is that during the Biden-Xi Jinping summit uh, two days ago, we, we saw the possible resumption of many dialogues, but not mail mail, and that worries me. Thank you. So that leads to my second question. And I'll, I'll open this up to the floor relatively soon. So we talked about how um, your understanding of whether China intends to have a crisis or conflict. But then the second question is exactly, Alexander, what, what you were alluding to. What, what is the possibility that we could stumble into a crisis or a conflict due to miscalculations, accidents, or, for example, another speaker visit of which all three sides aren't coordinating to the extent that we saw in August. Um, the, you know, uh, to a certain degree uh, that I, int I tended to believe that if there is an unintended incident uh, uh, occurred, uh, there, there are phone numbers. Uh, you know, we used to joke that it doesn't matter whether you have the phone number because nobody will pick it up anyway. Uh, you, you find your phone unanswered during a real crisis. But I think um, we are at the point that Beijing also had a great deal at stake. You know, if they do not respond, then they also have significant consequences to bear upon. 
Um, and um, I do not want it because I don't know, I do not want to uh, think too much about who would call whom and whether the communication lines are multiple uh, between Washington and Beijing or, or Hawaii and Beijing. And Beijing. Uh, but I, uh, I'm a little bit worried about how Taiwan would handle the unintended incident uh, without a communication line. Uh, should we call the uh, Camp Smith and say, hey, bro, you know, we don't have a communication line. Can you call someone? Or we should think of, a, you know, plan uh, a, a possible mechanism in order to prevent an unintended incident and, and, you know, being elevated into an unwanted war. Well, um it's easier to stumble if you're already moving downhill and there are a lot of rocks on your path. So I, I, that, that's sort of where I think we are right now. It, you could have an interesting debate about who has more open time on their calendar, our ambassador in Beijing or their ambassador in the United States, um, before he was elevated to the Politburo. State, Politburo. Um, so I, I think we're at a nadir right now. I, I would love to be optimistic about the robust communications, but I recall an incident that happened late in the last administration where Chairman Milley felt compelled to call his counterpart, uh, head of the Joint, uh, Joint Operations Department in Beijing, not once but twice, to reassure him that political tensions building in the United States over the election um, were not uh, a wag the dog scenario that would cause the United States to lash out uh, against China in order to uh, achieve a political outcome in the United States. The mere fact that, that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs thought that that was a plausible belief held by Chinese generals or political leaders is kind of terrifying. And it says more to me about the current scenario and how the Chinese think about us than any of the more kind of lofty things that we've been debating and discussing. Um, I think you, we have to be mindful that China's view of the United States is by design and for Communist Party purposes, deeply paranoid. You know, they don't believe that we accidentally bombed their embassy in Belgrade in 1999. Um, they believe and find it useful and necessary to believe that we were behind uh, popular uprisings in Xinjiang and the pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong. So through that paranoid lens, things by the United States that are maybe for performative effort in the United States or have to do with our own domestic political posturing, aren't viewed by the Communist Party that way. They view them as part of the actions of a declining hegemon, jealous of its power, willing to lash out to destroy countries and entire regions in order to maintain their primary position. Um, and so that is something you have to keep in mind. And that lens, which I think General Milley seemed to understand well at the end of the Trump administration, is something you have to take into account when you consider how our actions, our intentions, and our, our moves are, are viewed by them. I know I said I would open up, but I did want to follow up one more question. So if we have another House Speaker going to, China, uh, to Taiwan, Alexander, do you think Taiwan would respond the same? And what do you, how do you think China may respond? And then John, same to you. How do you think the United States may respond? How do you think China may respond? So. Well, I have to say that um, you know, Taiwan would, would not be in the position to uh, say to the next speaker and say, you are not welcome. Uh, we have our security concern. I think we will uh, take a positive uh, response to uh, the possible visit. But I think we will also need to learn from the lessons of uh, August uh, two months, uh, three months ago, that uh, things could be uh, even more severe than uh, before. So uh, I would say uh, several points. Number one, we need to work with the visiting party as well as the White House more closely. And we, as a partner, if we claim that this is the best period of U.S.-Taiwan relationship, I think we will have the heart and we need to sit down with both the White House and the Speaker's office to go through all the possible scenarios. Um, and point number two is that we need to consider to signal uh, Beijing 
that the visit will be true and um, the speaker is coming. Um, and it may carry different weight if that is a bipartisan delegation or a single party delegation and who are in the delegation. I, I think, you know, maybe people in Taiwan would have a specific DNA to understand how China would think uh, what is sensitive or not. I, I think political signaling without a communication line is also necessary for the current government uh, to think of. And number three is that we need to review how our military responded to the August crisis. Uh, we did not do a good job. You know, there were debate that whether, to what extent that we need to inform our general public about what's going on that particular day. Whether there will be a, you know, sending siren or nationwide text messaging alerting uh, people that there are missiles across the bow or just pretending uh, don't look up uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and translate that to a social resilience. Uh, uh, I, I think these are the three points that I think we need to think about. So if I could summarize quickly, Taiwan needs to more Taiwan will say yes to the visit, work more closely with the United States, develop firmer measures against potential PLA exercise. So it seems like a stronger position than what we saw in August. Is that a correct? Well, we need to correct and learn our own lessons from the past. So John, how do you think China may respond then? Well, I think I mean, Alexander can correct me. I think recently within the last couple of months, Taiwan's military announced that they've given the power to local forces to respond to violations of 12 mile, 12 mile air or maritime violations with uh, lethal force. So that's an interesting step. And if that sets the conditions for uh, what, could, what could occur in a future speaker visit. The thing is when, when Speaker Pelosi went, the US could plausibly argue that it wasn't unprecedented, that Speaker Gingrich had traveled to Taiwan, I think in 97. Um, the thing is he traveled to China first on that same trip. Um, and the context of U.S.-China relations was vastly different. So it wasn't viewed as, it wasn't liked by the Chinese, but it wasn't a casus belli because he had sort of, uh, you know, acknowledged China by visiting there first and going to Taiwan second. Um, at the time, the U.S.-China were actually in kind of a high spot in bilateral relations between the end of the Taiwan Missile Crisis, three presidential summits in the next 18 months between Jiang Zemin and President Clinton, and finally, uh, which all ended after the Belgrade embassy bombing. Um, I think as I noted in my comments uh, at the open, the Chinese now know exactly how far they can go, which is quite far indeed. You know, let's recall, they fired ballistic missiles over Taiwan, at least four, that landed in missile impact areas around the island. They had never done that. Um, it's also important to note what they didn't do. They didn't challenge twi Taiwan's 12 mile limit um, there were reports of some drones flying over the offshore islands at Jinmen, Matsu Archipelago, Dongyin. But those looked like they were civilian drones, not the PLA. If the PLA wants to fly drones, you're going to know it. Um, so the problem is that if a future speaker goes, it's not the first time since 1997. It's the second time in 12 months or 18 or 24 months. So now it's a pattern. It's now a precedent that speakers of the House the highest uh, representative of the U.S. legislative co-equal arm of government, and number two after the vice president in, in the line of succession to the president, is now routinely going to visit Taiwan. Um, you know, the reason why the Chinese staged a crisis in 95 over Li Denghui's visit to Cornell was because uh, the U.S. decision to allow him to go to Cornell as a sitting president, even for a, quote, personal visit, um, broke the, the commitments the United States had made to China upon recognition in 1979. So if we start to allow and even encourage and condone uh, high level officials of the US government, the, the, the leader of the co-equal branch of Congress to routinely visit Taiwan, the Chinese are going to make a very cogent point that we should listen to, which is the foundations of relations are now being destroyed by the United States you know, that there are alternatives to even the fraught peace that we've come to expect. 
There, the alternatives fall short, perhaps, of all-out war, crisis, or conflict, but they could mean the end of diplomatic relations, harder communications between the United States and Beijing, and probably between Taiwan and Beijing, uh, rather than more. So I just sort of pose to the audience. Uh, you know, in, in 2001, we had a, an incident where a Chinese fighter plane collided with a U.S. reconnaissance aircraft near Hainan Island. Um, the American crew, through amazing efforts by the pilot and co-pilot, landed that aircraft safely on Hainan Island. Um, the two presidents started to communicate, first through the ambassador and defense attaches in each capital, and then directly, um, or through public statements, so that that so-called EP3 crisis was resolved in 11 days. Um, the U.S. now flies many multiples of these reconnaissance flights that we flew back in 2001. We now routinely conduct freedom of navigation operations both off the coast of China, but especially in the South China Sea. So there's a lot more aircraft and ships of both countries moving in close proximity to each other with greater frequency. Uh, it's a matter of, of, of when, not if, another crisis occurs. If the circumstances were similar to 2001, do you think that crisis would be resolved in 11 days? I doubt it, because the crisis communication mechanisms that existed in 2001 were robust and deep. Um, the ambassador could expect to have his phone calls to the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the State Counselor returned, returned quickly. The defense attache had numerous contacts in Beijing with his PLA counterparts due to frequent visits by high-level officers to both countries. Um, today, we would have to rebuild crisis communications in the midst of crisis. Um, and I fear that that could turn into something more like the Pueblo incident with North Korea in the 1970s than the EP3 crisis of, of 2001. Sorry, did you want to add it? Well, it's just, uh, you know, we, we, we are uh, lazy, we are stupid, you know, we only <laughs> responded to crises, you know, you know, because you know, like us, we work at think tanks and we, 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 we talk in classrooms. We, we wanted to alert people that pre-planning, that preventive measures, that thinking ahead, do war games, are important. Uh, but, uh, but we also serve in the government. We know that how busy we have been. And it's extremely difficult to think ahead. And so, you know, just like cross-trade relationship in the past 30 years, we always responded to crisis or incidents. Uh, we, would, we did not do our homework well. Great. Well, thank you, Alexander. Thank you, John. I want to open up the floor now to questions. So we'll take a question from the room and then take one online. So I see a number of hands up. I think the one in front of me is waving very vigorously. So here, you first, and then we'll uh, turn to online questions. Uh, Thank you. Good morning. I'm Dimitri from the Financial Times. So I have a slightly different version of Bonnie's question. Uh, forget about Kevin McCarthy for a second. What if uh, Ron DeSantis, Tom Cotton, Josh Hawley, Mike Pompeo, Nikki Haley, et cetera, et cetera, all start to put Taipei on the campaign trail after Des Moines and South Carolina and New Hampshire? Do you think the Chinese would react even more aggressively than they reacted to Pelosi? particularly if one of those candidates looks like they might become the president. Oh, my God. Um, you know, if, 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 Beijing has, if Beijing has good American studies, if Beijing has necessary pool of talent that understand domestic American politics, they will send papers and alerts to their decision makers that you run the terribly high risks of playing into American domestic politics. And, and, and that would not be in Beijing's interest. I'm not sure that they have, but, uh, but uh, I, I think it's going to be very, very sensitive. And I hope that they do have the experts that understand not only U.S.-China relationship, bad relationship, but understand the American politics, understand the two political parties, understand the nuance and the info. You know, I shouldn't say that, but you know, on Capitol Hill, 
you know, there are a lot of things that probably people, uh, you know, living in another side of the world cannot understand, but will fall into the trap. Um, Dimitri, um, it, the visit isn't, isn't what could cause the crisis. It's the fact that you'd have then, as, the way you conveyed it, which may be plausible, would be a sort of train of Republican senior officials all vying for the highest office in the land, suddenly putting Taiwan on their map. I think the context, in, you know, right now, like um, Michael Pompeo has been to Taiwan, I think, three or four times since he left office, by my count, um, and, and seemingly well compensated, if you believe the press. Um, so that alone, I didn't notice a crisis over the last Mike Pompeo visit, right? So that by itself isn't a trigger. I think the trigger would be, would be the policy positions of those candidates and the policy positions of those vying for the nomination because I suspect many and perhaps most of the leading candidates for office, uh, with the possible exception of a retiree in Florida, would actually be campaigning that we should drop strategic ambiguity and recognize Taiwan as a separate entity from China and commit full-throatedly to Taiwan's military defense. I think that that is what would precipitate the crisis, not just the, you know, camera shots on the, on the tarmac in Taipei um, or, or Shinju, but it would be the policy shift signaled by the Republican Party toward a, a, a virtual, from a Chinese perspective, abandonment of the basis for diplomatic relations. Thank you. Oh, sorry, uh, online question, Brian? Yeah, so uh, this question was submitted uh, online uh, from Emma McGill, a student at American University. Uh, she says, Dr. Huang, you mentioned that China has learned from watching Russia and the cost of its military invasion. However, with so many Western resources directed towards Ukraine, China also has a window of opportunity to push into Taiwan without as much resistance from the West. So how does the invasion of Ukraine impact the likelihood of conflict escalating over Taiwan and potential U.S. responses? Um, I'm the person, uh, at least in Taiwan, I have constantly uh, say to my audience and students that do not look at Taiwan through the lens of Ukraine because we are different. One reporter uh, came to Taiwan uh, uh, and did an interview with me. And, and uh, when we sat down, he said, you know, I, I just uh, came from Donbas, Ukraine. And uh, I'm a you know, war reporter. Um, and he, he said, you, if you were not there, you do not understand that how courageous that the Ukrainian people fight. And you would not understand that, you know, exactly because he was there before February 24 and after, and in the zone. And he said that when, when the war started and uh, there were immediate announcement uh, or order uh, directive from President Zelensky that all the men above the age of 18 should stay home, uh, stay in the country. Um, and he said, if China attacked Taiwan, would, would we make the same uh, policy announcement? I said, we won't. He said, why? I said, because we are an island, you know, because no one can go out anyway. And so that's a different uh, scenario. I, I, th I think uh, China understand that the difficulties for Taiwan to seek foreign assistance once the military operation started. But China also learned the lesson that how the world together responded in other form, if not military only. You know, the different, totally different characteristics of economic sanction. Um, you know, the China's, China understand their own, uh, you know, vulnerability on uh, energy imports, if not only and in addition to food imports. So, so I think, um, you know, if we make argument based on rational assessment uh, and, and believe that everyone in all three capitals are cool-headed, and there, there are attractions there. Uh, it, it, it would not be a free fall of the uh, scenario. Don't you want to um, weigh in? 
Yeah, I agree with a lot of what Alex just said. Um, I, I think it's hard, it's too easy to overdraw lessons from Ukraine for Taiwan. It's always had very unique circumstances. The one, there's, there's a lot of kind of rumble in the U.S. You know, maybe I'm spending too much time on Twitter, but a lot of calls for enhanced deterrence. And by that, they mean sort of full-throated military focus on Taiwan, even at the expense of Ukraine. Um, but I, I think the Chinese Communist Party can help but observe something, which is d despite the aggressiveness of the Russian invasion, uh, its human rights violations, its war crimes, that NATO has not directly intervened. You know, calls to establish a um, no-fly zone over Ukraine were, I think, wisely uh, ignored. Um, and even with the recent incident yesterday in Poland, um, you could tell that, you know, the idea of, of bringing, you know, we don't want World War III. We don't want to conduct combat operations that could easily escalate against a very credible nuclear power, which is, in, in that, and then that context I noted, China's nuclear weapons build up. They're going to quintuple their inventory of nuclear warheads, most of which will be on ICBMs capable of reaching the United States over the course of this decade. And they're in the midst of that now. Um, People seem to talk as if the lessons of Ukraine with regard to the risk of nuclear escalation won't apply in the case of Taiwan. I find that very disturbing. China has been a credible nuclear power for decades. It's now a very highly credible and will soon be a near peer in terms of ICBM capability. You know, US and, so US and Russian ICBM totals are treaty limited at 1,550 each. Um, we then have a couple of other thousand other various warheads rolling around in our inventory. Hopefully not rolling around, but actually highly secure. Um, so China, you know, at, at the time, you know, for decades had 18 ICBMs that could hit us. Now they've got a couple hundred, so they'll have a thousand. That the U.S. could cavalierly decide that the rules of nuclear escalation and deterrence don't apply. Because one lesson I think they have learned from Ukraine is that um, credible nuclear deterrence enables conventional conflict in a, in, a, in a near state that's not a treaty ally, rather than deters it. Great, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Dong Hui Yu with China Review News Agency of Hong Kong. And uh, Dr. Huang mentioned uh, General Milley's statement yesterday. I also noticed that uh, he said that the PLA uh, is not yet ready to attack Taiwan, but he admitted that uh, uh, maybe his evaluation uh, is wrong because any political in incident may change the decision very quickly. So my question for John and Alex is, from your perspective, what kind of political incident or scenario may change the decision very quickly and advance the timeline? Thank you. I'll go first. Okay. Um, so I, I think that China has been very clear on what it would consider red lines. And um, one of my core assumptions that so far hasn't, I haven't had to reassess is that if those conditions were met, you know, I mentioned them earlier, China will go to war. Now, it may not invade because that depends on specific capabilities and its assessment of the level of risk that it would assume. But it has tremendous coercive capabilities. I recently wrote a piece for a competing think tank nowhere near as good as CSIS for <laughs> Carnegie that explained from a perspective of an old intelligence analyst who looked at China for way too long what that would look like, what it means for China to go to war, what it means to go to full-scale mobilization, to prepare its population for the idea that expectations of robust economic growth, which have become the norm for the last generation and a half in China, would no longer be the basis for party legitimacy, that instead it would be nationalism sovereignty, the defense of China's claim to the island against uh, uh, unacceptable provocation by Taiwan or the United States. So in my mind, if, if China decides to go to war, it's going to go to war in kind of an old-fashioned way. Uh, it, will be, it will be reignite the Chinese Civil War. Their goal will be reunification. They will seek through economic, military, political information, cyber, and diplomatic means to set the conditions for eventual victory. If the invasion doesn't look plausible because of early U.S. intervention, despite nuclear threat, 
um, then they will keep setting those conditions because Taiwan sits in their front yard and the U.S. has to come around the planet at the end of very long supply chains in order to sustain a military presence that can preserve Taiwan. The Chinese would have to be able to, you know, would accept and I think would well understand after five years of trade war and pending even more severe sanctions in the minds of some in the Hill or in the administration that it's going to bear an incredible economic cost uh, if it chooses to use coercive power against Taiwan. But I think that they would take those costs, that they have been hardening the party, the economy, its technological base, its energy infrastructure, in a way, for reasons not directly tied to imminent war, China's been preparing for that future um, in order to insulate themselves from diplomatic and economic pressure. Uh, General Milley always uh, said that in his assessment that he thinks that uh, President Xi Jinping is a rational actor, right? So I, I, I think, um, you know, it, it's always fun, to, you know, to do this exercise, you know, to imagine, because I do war games all the time. Um, but the, the issue is that, you know, if we are talking about a near term, short term, uh, one or two years, a political in event or a military incident that may escalate. I, I think uh, there are di so many different dozens of ways to, to respond to that. Uh, from uh, on the part of China. Uh, you know, uh, in August, my, my worry was not, uh, you know, missile being uh, flying across the bow. Uh, I worry is that Beijing decided to extend it from 72 hours to three weeks. Mm -hmm. Then that's the totally different calculation for us because all the incoming shipping energy supply will be disrupted. So, so maybe there, you know, as I said, there could be a vertical escalation. But how about horizontal? You know, uh, we still have more than one million Taiwan citizens living and working on the mainland. You know, so there are, that's why I have constantly say that Taiwan needs to be careful because of our own vulnerability. We need to be smart. Um, so I don't have a direct answer to you, but uh, still I do not believe that, you know, people on both sides of the Taiwan Strait, uh, you know, started to think uh, in the way that we will have to go into a military conflict in the short term. Great, thank you, Alexander. Another online question? Yeah, so uh, we have another question. I don't know if this mic's working. Um, we have another question uh, online from Dr. Morgan, retired DIA, uh, which is, do you expect more aggressive Chinese intelligence operations, uh, that is Ministry of State Security, directed against the U.S., whether that's domestic, uh, globally, or, or in the cyber realm? Either of you want to take a shot at this? Well, John He's is pointing the at me, perfect he? person to answer that. <laughs> I, I, um, uh, uh, they've been more aggressive anyway. Um, so even outside of the context of some scenario, you know, I think one of the, the, the major changes of the last 20 years, and there are myriad, is the Ministry of State Security uh, had to become an actual intelligence organization. Um, they, they, they've always been focused at least as much on counterintelligence inside China as they were on gaining access to foreign secrets. Um, but I think because, uh, paradoxically, China's success in the cyber domain compelled the Ministry of State Security as China's primary human collector to really up their game. So they've been aggressive. And you can track it from the Glenn Shriver case 10 years ago now, um, where they change their trade craft, are using non-Chinese, non-Chinese, you know, ethnicity targets, um, and practicing what I would call classic trade craft for the first time uh, against the United States. They've also developed their own cyber capabilities, although they're far from the main or even, uh, pro you know, dominant cyber actor within the Chinese intelligence and military network. So short answer, yes, they, but they were doing that anyway. I think I saw a testimony from FBI Director Ray just yesterday that China's uh, industrial and economic espionage by China, against the United States exceeded 
all other countries combined. I assume he's using some estimate of sort of value of the property stolen, or it could be number of hacking incidents. Um, so yes, but that's been the trend anyway. It hasn't been tied to a Taiwan scenario. I think what an actual conflict or crisis could precipitate would be destructive actions by the Chinese in the cyber domain, um, not just intelligence gathering or uh, property theft. Great. Uh, In-person question here. Geert van Brandt, retiree, interested in, the, uh, uh, in, in Asia in general. Um, has it ever dawned on the CIA, the military, even NATO, that the U.S. hasn't won a single war since World War II except Grenada? And despite the fact that the U.S. has spent trillions, think Afghanistan, Vietnam, Korea is still not resolved. Does it ever enter the calculations in their war games, the fact that we've never won a war since World War II? Uh, I guess I would translate that to um, how ready is the United States for a large-scale conflict? Uh, well, I, I hesitate to comment on U.S. policy or wars that began and, and ended or ended in sta stalemate before I was born. Um, I, I think, you know, that the, usually the, the do dominant mindset of the U.S. government on whether or not conflict is needed, it, it, it depends on whether we think we have other avenues to pursue national priorities. And, um, you know, a very wise person inside the USIC once told me that, um, you know, using the military, using military force um, is plan B. Um, diplomacy and non-coercive means are plan A, and there is no plan C. So uh, I, I think that the, you know, we'll continue to go forth uh, as we have, trying to assess the risk and hopefully learning from the past. Right. So another online question. Yeah. Um, uh, this question is from uh, Mike Moraz from the U.S. Uh, Defense Department. If current U.S. military deterrence actions increase the risk of unintended, unintended escalation into a conflict, where and how should the U.S. military assure allies and partners in the region while reducing that risk? If the PRC assumes the U.S. will intervene and has a, uh, a combat capable force, are deterrent actions even required? Great, thank you. And I think uh, if you want, you can also push back on the question itself. <laughs> Well, it's, um, I have to admit, it's a bit sensitive to me to respond, okay? Because, because I know something, but I can't say it. Uh, <laughs> the, I would say that um, uh, overt activities uh, uh, or using, uh, uh, you know, certain activities for political signaling or, or you know, posturing, uh, you know, sometimes becomes, um, you know, non-productive. Okay, but but uh, but uh, I still, you know, as a Taiwanese, I I would still hope that substantial, below the radar, you know. And uh, there are a lot of things that can be done. Uh, here in the front. Right here, right here. Yeah, hi. Uh, Tina Chong from Voice of America's China branch. My question is after the uh, Biden Xi uh, summit meeting, uh, uh, some analysts are saying that uh, Xi Jinping will now, because he's confident, uh, and he, he will now uh, conduct more foreign visits and uh, uh, to change the great uh, wolf warrior uh, uh, diplomacy and be more like uh, charismatic. Uh, so my thinking, is, my, my question is, uh, how does that affect uh, his attitude or policy or posture toward Taiwan? Will they be uh, less of a, uh, like 
gray zone operations, or uh, will he uh, change like the, the approach to Taiwan? Thank you. Anyone can speak for our American government? I can. Yeah. I can. I don't obviously don't speak for the U.S. government. I suspect Alexander doesn't either. No. But um, I, I would temper my expectations. I think that the Taiwan Strait dynamic and China's policy is based on some pretty fundamental ground bedrock, and uh, it's not going to shift because of one meeting, no matter how productive with the President of the United States. Um, I think, you know, if, if you see more of Xi Jinping abroad, it's because they're loosening COVID restrictions. And he's less fearful than he was 18 or 24 months ago about the potential health risk of traveling. Although I understand that at the G20, um, Hun Sen then tested positive for COVID. Correct me if I'm wrong. And our president had met with Hun Sen just two days before. So the risk is still out there, but I think Xi Jinping is going to show the Chinese flag more with a higher profile here in 2023. Um, you, you couldn't do with a lower profile because until a few months ago when he went to Central Asia, he hadn't left China for going on two years. Um, I don't think that if you really want to signal that wolf warrior diplomacy is going to recede and be replaced by actual diplomacy, I'm not sure you would have uh, elevated Qin Gong uh, from the embassy here to a more senior position within the foreign affairs framework. Okay, I'm cognizant we have five minutes. I want to collect a, uh, a couple of questions in the room. Actually, I only see four questions in the room, so let's collect, oh, sorry, five. Let's collect them, and then uh, we'll give the floor to Alexander and John for whatever comments you may have or responses to the questions. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Ken Scabe from Marvillian uh, Corporation. Uh, so uh, my question, I, I think this is very extreme and a hypothetical question, but if the status quo in, in, in uh, Taiwan Strait is maintained until 2045 or 2046, and you have a, a similar debate again, so which side do you want to take? <laughs> so, in other words, uh, for CCP, uh, to what extent uh, do you think the, you know, the Taiwan unification or uh, Chinese rejuvenation or second hundred dream uh, is, is a very concrete goal? Or do you think the CCP can uh, uh, can can uh, delay this this goal beyond the the, the twenty forty nine. Hi, uh, my name is Lauren, and I'm a student at American University. And my question for um, both of you is, what policy gaps do you think you can identify for United States um, deterrence to try and encourage um, the uh, Chinese government to allow for Taiwan to maintain its current status? Hello, my name is Max and I'm from Munich, Germany, and I've got a short question because the focus is always on competition and to avoiding conflict between the US and China. Um, to follow up the speech of the Senator Markey, um, do you see any fields of cooperation or any, or any common goals that could, uh, that could have the power to improve the relationship between the US and China? Senator Markey said, the fight against climate change do you see any other fields that could have the power to improve the relationships? Okay, I, I think I see, saw the lady back there in the red. Oh, okay, okay, and then these two questions here, and then okay. um, one, the front row. Thanks. Hi, uh, Eric Lachica from the U.S. Filipinos for Good Governance. Uh, next week. Um, Vice President uh, Kamala Harris will be in the Philippines for two days, and she's going to focus uh, on the, uh, the upgrading the Philippine Coast Guard, the, uh, the, white, sheep, the white ship strategy. Do you think that's uh, going to be a good move and welcomed uh, by Taipei, and also it'll be viewed as uh, non-threatening? It's uh, going to be protecting the fisheries of the, of the Philippines. Thank you. Hi, my name's Max Bessler. I'm with the economics program right upstairs. 
Uh, I just had a quick question in the vein of that gentleman's question, too, about cooperation. I was wondering whether the recent Xi Jinping and Biden summit meeting and the follow-up uh, plan with uh, Secretary Blinken visiting China, does that affect your calculus and position at all over this debate proposition? Is there a chance for cooperation headed forward in economic sort of spheres specifically? Great, thank you. So as we give uh, Alexander and John some time to figure out which questions they can answer in the remaining time left, I encourage folks to do the post-debate vote voting right now. Uh, so again, the voting procedure is exactly the same. Uh, you can either go to online, the online link, or you can go, you can text 22333, China Power, vote A for agree, uh, and B for disagree. So while folks are doing that, as we're seeing the results come in, uh, maybe I'll go to Alexander first for any questions that you want to answer, and, uh, and then John for any questions that you have time for to answer. Uh, I'll just respond to the question that I feel that I could you know, do it. Um, I'm not sure whether we should think that what kind of policy gap that China allows I think it's uh, multilateral. It, it, you know, especially, um, I would say, in the past two, three years, and, um, you know, it, it, even with the United States, we, we, we cannot see a, a country that would dominate and define that without working with the allies to define, you know, what kind of policy uh, is, or we will uh, relinquish our position and let China define it. You know, I was only responded to the question about the Philippines. Um, uh, you know, because uh, for Taiwan, uh, if we are talking about military terms, um, we are not terribly worried to, about issue or incident to our north because the U.S.-Japan alliance is right there. You know, every ship every aircraft passing through Miyako Strait would be monitored. And that's their vulnerability. But for Basi Channel and um, the waters between Taiwan and the Philippines, that's the key. That's the problem. And that's the most military activity that Chinese People's Liberation Army had conducted. So we would like to see a stronger U.S.-Philippine collaboration. On or the increase of uh, the Filipino capability. Of course, I admit that we have sovereignty claims issue uh, between uh, re the Republic of China and the Republic of the Philippines. But, but, but at this moment, I think that a strengthening of the Filipino uh, defense capability and capacity is in the interest of Taiwan. I think I'd, I'd like to uh, respond to about how we can build um, cooperation or at least see an opportunity in the wake of the Biden-Chi meeting at, in Bali. Um, yeah, I think it's good. I mean, if the two sides want to put a floor under the decline in bilateral relations and start to regularize senior context, I mean, this would be the first time the Secretary of State has been to China in that position. Um, partly because of pandemic, I mean, but they were meeting in third countries with Chinese counterparts. So that just shows you kind of how distant the relationship had become. Um, I, I don't argue for talk for talk's sake. I think that was a problem with the previous strategic and economic dialogue model where it dominated the calendar and the talks are going to happen whether relations were progressing smoothly or not. But I think you want to be in the room and be heard directly, not through filters, not through the press. You want to be able to speak frankly to them, uh, frame areas of competition if possible, and I think you know, both sides have talked about kind of global goods um, that could be a basis. Um, I think for the US, if I were going to be policy prescriptive, which I spent 40 years trying not to be, uh, do more, say less. Um, you can do a lot with Taiwan and reassure without announcing it through the Pentagon Public Affairs Office or the White House. If you're doing something militarily around the island, on the island, the Chinese will know. You don't need to tell them. They, they, they have their own means to know. Um, and Taiwan will know, and they will draw assurance from that. Um, I, I think that, you know, as this issue has gone from being the kind of bailiwick of experts to the fodder of pundits, 
um, that it's become politicized in the U.S. in a way that you know we had, we had mercifully not been, except for episodic crises. Um, and, and I think we, we need you know uh, on the U.S. to sort of take a breath and um, conduct U.S. diplomacy, U.S. military operations, um, allied. Uh, reassurance uh, through good diplomatic means, not always rely on Twitter. Great. With that, uh, let's uh, look at the post-debate results. I, oh, I think they, <laughs> the results have not changed so much. So, uh, but I, I personally kind of am in the position where John is, which is uh, very pessimistic. So, but not that the two of us, our results, <laughs> our views actually way very much there, but. On that note, I do want to thank uh, Alexander and John very much for this very fascinating debate and very enriching discussion. So I, I'd like to give a round of applause to our debaters. Staying around, we're going to take a 10-minute break, and then we'll reconvene at around 11. Thank you.
China Power Conference. So again, I'm Bonnie Lin, Director of the China Power Project and Senior Fellow for Asian Security at the Center for Strategic International Studies. So for this discussion, we're focusing on China-Russia. And the proposition is Beijing views a strong China-Russia relationship as a net strategic asset. Uh, because this is such a complex topic, our two experts decided, asked me to make this a discussion, not a debate. So hopefully through their discussion, we will impact the various different elements of this issue. But as you recall, in February of this year, just preceding Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Russian President Vladimir Putin and Chinese President Xi Jinping issued statements that the China-Russia relationship has no limits. The two countries continue to share both a close economic relationship and deepening military ties. However, we've also seen that Ch Russia's ongoing invasion of Ukraine has damaged China's economy, and China has been a relu reluctant to fully voice support of Russia's activities. So in, for today's discussion, we've uh, asked our two experts to help unpack various dimensions of this. But I, I think I do want to provide the caveat that the debate topic, again, is just a simplification of this very complex issue. So before we enter this debate, we're going to do what we did earlier, which is we're going to do a poll. Again, the polling instructions are online. Um, so you can either poll through the online link or you can poll using your phone. So you would text 22333, China Power, one word. If you agree with this proposition, you would select A. If you disagree, you would select B. So we're getting the live polling results right now in the room. Uh, and again, this is not a debate, so I don't think it's either of your responsibilities to argue, agree, or disagree. But let's just give it one more moment. And as we're doing the polling, let me actually introduce our speakers. So our first guest who will be speaking is Mr. David Shulman. He is the Senior Director of Global China Hub at the Atlantic Council, where he leads the Council's work on China. Prior to joining the Atlantic Council, Mr. Shulman was senior advisor at the International Republican Institute, where he oversaw the Institute's work building the resilience of democratic institutions around the world against the influence of China, Russia, and other autocracies. Our second guest is Ms. Yunsun, senior fellow and co-director of the East Asia Program and director of the China Pro Program at the Stimson Center. So her expertise is in Chinese foreign policy, U.S.-China relations, and China's relations with its neighboring countries and authoritarian regimes. So I'm very grateful that both Dave as well as Yun are with us today. Uh, and we'll see their uh, uh, points very shortly. But let me now turn to the poll. So based on the live poll today, we have almost an equal split compared to the polling earlier, about 55% agree that Russia is a net strategic asset for Beijing, and about 45 disagree with that. Let me also show the Twitter poll that we did that was over a longer span of time, also very similar polling, about 50, almost 50-50 uh, exactly. So I think this will make a very interesting discussion, and I'm eager to see if this discussion will change any of the views. So with that, let me turn the floor to Dave. Well, thanks, Bonnie, um, and thank you uh, for, to CSIS for, for having me. I'm really looking forward to this, uh, and I'm particularly looking forward to, to having this conversation with, with Yun Soon, who's uh, such a great expert on this topic, as well as many others. Um, I am surprised by that polling result, and I think uh, Yun and I both are, and that's part of why we had uh, decided to discuss this as rather than debate it, uh, because I think we were largely firmly in the, uh, in the yes camp. Um, because to me, you know, the question, does Beijing view a strong China relationship uh, as a strategic asset? You know, Beijing, not me, not anyone here, uh, not anyone in the Washington think tank community. Um, to me, the answer is, is fairly evidently yes. Um, and I think that's fundamentally because uh, Xi Jinping has stuck with Vladimir Putin and Russia without much deviation, I think one could argue, over the last nine months, despite what I think we could see as quite close to the sort of stress test one might design if you wanted to challenge the durability of China's commitment to this relationship. We're talking not only about utter embarrassment of the Russian military uh, in Ukraine and what that might mean for China's valuation of Russia as a security partner, but also 
diplomatic and reputational costs that China has borne as a result of its tacit backing for Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine and ongoing brutality there, uh, particularly with Europe, which is a critical economic partner for China. Uh, and meanwhile, Russia's own economic um, worth as a partner for China beyond energy has shrunk further as its isolation has grown. Um, so despite all of this and more, China clearly continues to back Russia. And as Foreign Minister Wang Yi uh, told his counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, in his first post-20th Party Congress foreign call a couple weeks ago, China firmly supports Russia and wants to push relations to an even higher level. Beijing wouldn't do this if it, unless it viewed the maintenance of a strong relationship with Russia as an important asset. Um, so to me, the question isn't, you know, does, does China view, feel this way? But the question is why? Um, and I think the most obvious answer is that Xi Jinping views Russia as invaluable in the protracted geostrategic competition that he expects to unfold in coming years and decades with the United States. Xi just underscored this at the 20th Party Congress uh, a couple weeks ago, that the United States, which was not mentioned by name, but we knew who he was talking about, is looking to contain and suppress China. And it's clear that Washington plays a central role in this very dark picture of China's external security environment that Xi painted not just militarily, not just over Taiwan, uh, but also through employing a range of efforts in the economic space, in the tech domain, aimed at undermining China's development with the implicit potential to complicate the party's delivery on its promises to complete uh, national rejuvenation of the Chinese people and ultimately endanger the regime's hold on power. And Russia, despite all of its weaknesses, is really the only partner globally that can help China fend off the United States and compete with the United States in a number of really key ways. And so I'm gonna focus on three areas. First, in the defense domain, China values Russia as a distraction, one that limits Washington's ability to make good on its oft stated goal, articulated I think more clearly than ever in the recently published national security strategy and national defense strategy, to focus like a laser on China as our most important and consequential geopolitical challenger and principal national security threat. Now, certainly we do see the United States successfully shifting more resources and attention to address China, to address the Indo-Pacific. Um, that's evident more than ever this week, right, when we're watching what the administration's doing in Asia. But that acute threat from Russia that the Biden administration describes unquestionably keeps U.S. attention divided. It's focused on the European theater. It's also focused on Russian interference inside the United States, uh, which I'll address later. China recognizes that Russia's war and the potential for escalation there and elsewhere in Eastern Europe complicate matters for strategic planners in the Pentagon who are figuring out how to handle simultaneous contingencies across multiple regions, and also that China's defense partnership with Russia and the potential for joint planning and operations between them raises the prospect for coordinated actions and the need for the U.S. to deter two peer adversaries at once. Beijing knows that despite what has happened in Ukraine, much of Russia's military capabilities that the United States worries about most, its submarines, its strategic and tactical nuclear arsenal, and cyber and electronic warfare capabilities are unaffected by the war and remain a potent threat to the United States. And specifically on nuclear forces, I think Chinese leaders are attuned to the fact not only that Russia remains a nuclear superpower, obviously, but that the United States is not confident in our ability to deter China, an aggressive Russia, or possibly a threat from both at the same time. The recently released nuclear posture review, frankly, didn't shed much light here. It doesn't describe the need to deter both China and Russia simultaneously or how to do so. It simply states that a near simultaneous conflict with two nuclear armed states would constitute an extreme circumstance, which is not exactly reassuring. In the defense procurement area, Russia's value to China has waned in recent years, but Russia provides China with advanced weapon systems that enhance China's air defense its anti-ship, anti-submarine capabilities, and military technical cooperation continues to grow between China and Russia, as have the frequency, scope, and complexity of joint military exercises. Russian armed forces are the PLA's most important foreign exercise partner, no question. And just in August, despite the war, thousands of Chinese forces were in Russia for the Vostok exercise. It's fair to argue that these exercises are still limited in terms of their jointness, but they have made strides on interoperability as well as on institutionalizing ties between the two militaries, and the expanding geographic scope of these exercises is significant as well. 
So I think all of this adds up to Beijing clearly valuing a strong and stronger defense relationship with Russia. Second, I want to move on to the diplomatic and economic front. So Russia's invasion has arguably single-handedly reinvigorated a U.S. alliance system that some had declared was on life support or brain dead. And Beijing has been, I think, unhappily surprised by the vigorous U.S. and NATO-led response to the invasion and the effort to punish Russia economically. But rather than forcing Xi to rethink the wisdom of aligning with Russia, I think Beijing's surprise at Washington's response and rallying of allies has only exacerbated the acute vulnerability that Chinese leaders feel when they consider the various sorts of crises we were just hearing about in the previous session and how they would play out over Taiwan. Vulnerabilities which Russia is critical to helping mitigate. And these concerns were reflected again in Xi's 20th Party Congress work report, which underscored repeatedly the need for security, not just in the military domain, but regarding energy, regarding food, and other critical inputs that Chinese leaders fear the U.S. might try to cut off, and which China, now Moscow's single biggest energy customer, could rely on Russia to provide across that 4,000-kilometer border they share and through the pipelines that cross it in the event of a crisis. This heightened vulnerability also raises Russia's utility as a partner in reducing reliance on the U.S.-centric global financial system in the wake of the financial measures undertaken against Moscow, including through de-dollarization. Now, cooperation between China and Russia in this de-dollarization domain is not new. Uh, Russia began to prioritize it uh, after sanctions following its 2014 annexation of Crimea, and then China began to pay more attention after the trade war with Washington kicked off in 2018. Actual cooperation has been limited thus far, but I think that China's fears about the ramifications of a largely U.S. dollar-denominated financial system and how the U.S. might leverage this have now been supercharged, and I think this is a really key area to watch. Lastly, in this space, partnership with Russia is also critical at the multilateral level. This is most evident, of course, on the U.N. Security Council, uh, where China's 13 most recent vetoes have all aligned with Russian vetoes. But it's also seen in a variety of foreign policy initiatives that China has undertaken to increase its influence globally relative to the U.S. and its allies, including in regional forums that exclude the United States and its allies. And I'm thinking primarily here of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is headquartered in China and and, um, of which China is Russia is a core member, Uh, the BRICS grouping uh, of leading developing uh, economies, both of which Chinese officials routinely make clear remain diplomatic priorities for them. Third, and the last section I want to get into here is the democracy and human rights domain. Now, when the China-Russia joint statement came out in February, just a couple weeks ahead of Russia's invasion, analysts were poring over it, and there was, I think, some dismissal of the fact that the entire first section of this joint statement, if anyone here recalls it, was on democracy and human rights. And it was dismissed by many as kind of the fluff before you got to the strategic meat of the document. But I think it's important to recognize the significance of that language, which was the summation of these two regimes' view of the strategic necessity of wresting away from the United States and its allies the right to use democracy and human rights as a cudgel, and which Chinese leaders view as a thinly veiled excuse to prevent China from achieving its rightful place as a fully risen great power at the heart of global governance. Now, we know there are clear differences in these two countries' governing systems and their ideologies, uh, or in the Russian case, perhaps absence of ideology. Um, but there are two author- these are two th- authoritarian states that are led by two increasingly personalist dictators who judge that the United States is hell-bent on undermining their rule and who share a vision of a less democratic world, a values-agnostic global order that is more hospitable to the continued r- uh, rule of each country's regime and, in China's case, one which is amenable to a CCP-led China as the leader of a revised international system. And Russia is of great value to China in its drive to eliminate the liberal normative underpinnings of the international system. Together, they challenge universal human rights and weaken rights protections at the UN, cloaked in supposed respect for sovereignty in the UN Charter. They're challenging the very meaning of human rights and democracy, as we saw in both the joint statement and then subsequent statements. Russia is a partner in shaping the global narrative to correct what Beijing views as America's unjust dominance of global discourse. They're doing this through common messaging and propaganda, Uh, coordinated or not, um, and also through information operations, and by using shared platforms to amplify each other's messaging. So the national security strategy underscored that China is the one country with the intent and the capability to revise the global order, and I fully agree with that, um, but I think Beijing also views Russia as a critical partner for China 
in achieving those aims. And one last point on this. I think in particular China does value Russia's capability and intent to interfere in individual democracies and exacerbate divisions in open societies, including the United States, through a variety of means. Beijing, I think as most know, has not taken as aggressive an approach to, as, to, as Russia uh, to disinformation or to interference in political processes in the United States and other democracies, but it has adopted Russian-like tactics in the last couple of years, and I think developments in this area uh, of their partnership will be very important to watch uh, in the years and months going forward, particularly if U.S.-China ties continue to worsen. So we have these three areas in which Russia is a clear strategic asset to China. Uh, and I want to make one, one last point here uh, before turning it over to you. Um, this question of Russia as a junior partner. This used to be one of, if not the first item, raised in discussions that China-Russia watchers would have about what could cause problems in the relationship, right? The notion that Russia simply couldn't abide being a junior partner uh, in a relationship with China because that would flip just the traditional way in which uh, the relationship has gone and it was not, not something that, that, that Vladimir Putin could accept. But Russia now has nowhere else to go, right? And now China is squarely in the driver's seat in determining the future trajectory of the relationship. So I'd argue that this junior partner dynamic doesn't damage the value of, Russia's, uh, of Russia to China, but enhances it. Uh, and I think China is now a senior partner that potentially could make demands well beyond the kinds of things we'd already seen around driving a hard bargain on energy deals to gain concessions, if need be, on traditional points of friction with Russia or on collaboration in sensitive areas that Russia might otherwise uh, in the past have refused. So we can look at areas uh, in, in potential uh, disputes or frictions over Central Asia. We could look at China potentially leveraging um, its, its role in the relationship to get Russia to do things in its relations with India. If China-India relations were to get worse, uh, we could see some of these dynamics in the Arctic possibly. Uh, maybe Russia is pushed uh, to offer some more in terms of sensitive defense procurements uh, that it wouldn't otherwise want to give, access to Russian military facilities. This is all very speculative, obviously, but I think it goes to the point that there's an array of areas where Russia could potentially be an even more loyal and valuable partner in Russia's fight against the United States, given the dynamics of where this relationship is heading, and it could sacrifice its interests because China is really the only game in town for Russia. So beyond what I've laid out in terms of Russia as an asset to China, there's still headroom left, I think, in terms of strategic value to Beijing of strong ties with Russia. Um, so I will stop there. Thank you, Dave. So Yun, over to you. I'm going to start by applauding for David because uh, he made such an eloquent case that Russia is and will remain an asset for China. And I don't think that's really the question. I think that we all know that Russia will remain as an asset for China. But the question is how much? And also between the balance of Russia being an asset and Russia being a liability, what is the net assessment here? Um, so we all know why China thinks Russia is, uh, is an asset. There's economic reasons, there's strategic reasons, there's also um, democracy and human rights perspective about the international, international relations. And by February 24th, I think the Chinese leader was still believing that we're gonna have, uh, China and Russia are going to have a no limit cooperation uh, a relationship. But the question is what has changed? What has changed in the, nine, in the past eight and a half months that will pose the question that does China still view, uh, view Russia as a pure asset or as a net asset? Well, what is some of the perceptions and assessment about Russia being more of a liability? And then we can decide that whether it's a net asset or it's a net, net, net liability. And I agree that China will build a stronger relationship with Russia. But the question is how is stronger defined? Is, Russia go, is China going to import more crude oil from Russia? Absolutely. If you look at the trade number, be prepared. It's going to be a pretty big hike this year. China is not only importing more crude oil from Russia by volume, because of the price increase, the value of the Chinese crude import, uh, import from Russia is going to be significantly higher than, uh, than last year. But does that suggest a stronger relationship with Russia? How do we define, how do we judge that the relationship is stronger? That's another question. And last but not least, I think there are also two questions that we don't yet know the answer. The first one is, 
what is going to happen to the, to the war in Ukraine? We seem to get a sense that Russia is not doing so well, but what exactly will be the end result of the, of the war, which will have a significant impact over how China sees Russia and how China strategizes on this relationship? And the second factor, which David did mention, is that what will happen to China-Russia relations if Russia indeed loses? We assume that, well, then China will be in the, in the driver's seat and Russia will have no option but has that been the behavior pattern that we have observed from Russia, that Russia just gives up and completely listens to the only, uh, the only buyer in town? That doesn't seem to be the historical record. And there are those indicators that we can look at to see whether this relationship has become more dominated by China, but we don't know that yet. So what I will try to present to you is how China's attitude towards Russia has changed. We all knew what it used to look like, but after the nine months of war in Ukraine, is China still sees Russia, seeing Russia in the same light or in the same way? And my argument is that subtle but important changes have gradually but surely come to Beijing's policy towards Russia. It is not a 180 degree change. It is not even a 90 degree change. The strategic competition with the United States like uh, David has elaborated, remains to be China's top consideration. And Russia will always be seen as, well, a useful and somewhat manageable instrument in that context. However, under the seemingly neutral statement, less in important policy reassessment, and I call attitudinal change towards Russia. These are not at least reflected in the two recent cases or the two signs of change, as I call them. The first sign is the demotion of Le Yucheng, three months after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It had been discussed many times by people. Some see him as a scapegoat for Xi, as Le Yucheng was only following the policy direction that Xi had decided. If anything, Le has been blamed for not giving Xi a fair warning about Russia's imminent invasion of Ukraine, or he had not been aware of such a plan to begin with which means that he was either incompetent or disloyal. So the result is that no matter what, um, his performance on this particular issue is regarded as uh, unsatisfactory. And it does pose a question uh, or post uh, embarrassment to Xi's authority. Le's demotion from a different perspective reflects Xi Jinping's shifting positions on Russia. To remove Le, is now seen as to reorient China's previous pursuit of the highest level of alignment with Russia. It also means that the Russian gun in the foreign policy apparatus is no longer holding Xi Jinping's ears. Three out of the five Central Committee members from the foreign policy apparatus have a European background, or have a Europe background. Two of them were spokesperson of the, used to be the spokesperson of the foreign ministry. The shift suggests China's own pivot from Russia towards Europe, an emphasis on public diplomacy and a battle over the international discourse. The second, and I call it even more significant sign of change, is Xi's commitment to jointly oppose the use of nuclear weapons or the threat to use nuclear weapons during his meeting with German Chancellor Scholz on November 4th. The version published by the Chinese Foreign Ministry reads, the international community should jointly oppose the use of, use of or the threat to use nuclear weapons, advocate for the unacceptability of the use of nuclear weapons and nuclear wars, and prevent a nuclear crisis in the Euro-Asia Euro continent. The position is significant for several reasons. First, China's position on this matter has completely changed. In early March, when the war first broke out, Xi Jinping was going to have a virtual summit with two European leaders uh, on March 8th. And before that, summit, that summit, Europe pushed for China to either jointly or unilaterally make a statement about the unacceptability of use of nuclear weapons. And China refused. So at that time, China said no. But now, looking at eight months later, China's position is completely reversed. On this matter, China's shifting position, China's shifting positions suggest that China is now okay with publicly taking positions that it knows would antagonize Russia. 
It suggests less willingness to accommodate Russia and cover for Russia, and it suggests less respect for Russia's bottom lines, given that Russia will most likely resort to escalation to de-escalate. The public nature of the Chinese statement also takes away the Russian leverage. And it, does not, it will be difficult for Moscow not to see this as a step in the back. Chinese interlocutors have been quietly telling their Russian counterparts in bilateral dialogues that, Russia, uh, that China opposes the use of nukes. What has been shocking for them is that Russia's response was, reuse of nukes is really not that bad. Especially if it's tactical nuclear weapons, we can control the contamination. I think the Chinese do not believe that the use of nukes is imminent but they were still appalled by the Russian perspective on this. From the protracted war of attrition in uh, Ukraine, two of the previous Chinese beliefs of Russia are validated and reconfirmed. The first one is, Russia is a country torn between great power ambition and the lack of great power capability. And the second assessment is that Russia is a destructive power and only uses a strategy of chaos. So what China has been disillusioned from the war in Ukraine, however, is much more significant than this validation of these two beliefs. While China used to believe that Russia, um, used, to believe, used to believe that Russia under Putin has superior military strategies and capabilities, the reality of the Ukraine war certainly tells a different story. It has demonstrated many weaknesses of the Russian military force, including resources, mobilization, training, technology, you name it. The only inevitable conclusion is that Russia is not the strong military power as we believed. Meanwhile, the Chinese also began to challenge the conventional wisdom that Russia is good at strategy. Strategy defined as diplomatic maneuver, strategic manipulation, and hybrid warfare and the Chinese believe that, well, the previous belief that Russia could use strategic maneuver to punch above its weight. What Beijing used to look up to Russia for, now it is disillusioned by Putin's lack of preparation, resources, and options to navigate the way out of the current quagmire. The reassessment has led to a key attitudinal change that now when the Chinese policy community refers to Russia, it is with a much less sense of respect. There's even a sense of scorn and disrespect. Referring to the current situation, some of, the, some of the Chinese interlocutors would say that Russia has no sense of shame anymore, which is not something that the Chinese used to say about Russia. The earlier sense of sympathy about Russia is gone because when the Chinese were sympathetic and they were defend, defending Russia on the NATO expansion during the earlier months of the war. For the Chinese, NATO expansion might have provided the justification to the war. But the Russia's losing the war and embarrassing China at the same time is not justifiable. Like the Chinese have said from the very beginning of the war, the only bigger crime than starting a war is to start one and lose it. <laughs> Two things are clear about China's future positions. The first one is that China's attitude towards Russia shifts within the battlefield development. When Russia was doing relatively well before summer, China's assessment of Russia was much less negative. If somehow Russia is able to turn things around miraculously and came out of the war as a, as a winner, China will be more careful in the, in the public's display of displeasure and, calcul and is calculous about, uh, about dissing Russia once in a while. The second assessment is that China will not abandon Russia. Even Russia loses in the Ukraine war, China will build a stronger relationship with Russia with more cooperation, quote, quote. This is because Russia remains a useful instrument in China's effort to counter the United States. With a weaker Russia, China hopes for more ability to influence Moscow's decision making and rein in its destructive behavior, but good luck on that. The public opposition to the use of nukes is a good example in this regard. But the question is, is Moscow going to take it? Or as we believe, Moscow will have no option but to take it. History does not really support that, um, su support that argument because if you look at what happened in 2014, during the Crimea, Crimea crisis, Russia did offer China Yamal 1. But four years later, 
Russians decided, well, we didn't get a good, de good enough deal. So therefore, the deal China got for Yamal 2 has been significantly less favorable than Yamal 1. So is that attitude or is this shift of power going to be permanent enough to change Russia's calculus and its behavior towards China? Well, China, well, Ru Russia has been called China's junior partner for some time. The legacy of Sovietization during the earlier period of the People's Republic of China has consistently had a psychological impact over the Chinese leadership and population, coloring their judgment about Russia's strengths and weaknesses in a pro-Russia favorable direction. The war in Ukraine might in fact be the psychological turning point in China's mentality about Russia. That China are finally looking at Russia as a power it is, not the power that China thought it is. And what that means is that this awakening is already obvious among the Chinese elites and the policy circle, and it, it will gradually spread to the public, especially if Beijing decides to tone down its pro-Russia propaganda, as it has. The Chinese do expect the bilateral trade to grow in the near term, like I mentioned, uh, especially considering the hike of energy price. But I think the Chinese interlocutors and analysts are also more sober about the future growth of Sino-Russia trade. And there's going to be a cap to how much it can grow. Because if you look at China's energy projection, China aims for the carbon emission peak by 2035, and aims for the carbon neutrality by 2060, which means what Russia can provide in terms of China's whole energy charge is only going to decline in the long run. And if you look at the bilateral economic integration, what else does Russia have to offer? And I'll just end, end, end there and I'll look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you, Yun. Uh, maybe um, given the fact that we covered so much ground, let me, let me start by asking a question uh, to uh, both of them about um, how do we unpack sort of China's views on Russia when we're talking about so many different elements of China, right? There's Xi Jinping, there's his team, and then there's, of course, the general public and Chinese academic, uh, Chinese elites. And I know you and you, um, you, you engage in extensive track two discussions with them. If you could share with us what are some of the views that you've been hearing? It's, you were already sharing some of those in your, uh, in your opening comments, but what are, you, what are the views that you're hearing from Chinese academics, and how do you see their views in, in terms of being reflected in, in terms of both Xi's views, or at least the top leadership's views on Russia? And then for Dave, if you wanted to weigh in here in terms of what you see as if there are any gaps or discrepancies between these different views. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I would say in China's Russia policy community, there have always been these two camps. So there are these strategists who are not Russia experts. And these strategists look at China's external relations from a grand strategy point of view that, yes, the United States is the biggest, biggest threat for China, therefore China has to align with Russia. And then the, there are these Russia specialists. And without much, many exceptions, Russia specialists usually hold a very negative and a pessimistic view about Russia's long-term uh, well, long future and the, uh, the future of the China-Russia relation. They're also the ones who advocate that Russia uses a strategy of chaos. It's a disruptive power instead of a cooperative power. It represents a fundamentally different approach to international system than from China. Because remember, China only wants to reform the international system, not to create a new one, but through reform. But Russia uses much more disruptive and destructive approach towards that, uh, towards that, uh, that same question. So within the Chinese policy community, by the end of the day, they all look at what Xi Jinping says, right? So Xi Jinping has to decide if he, and I think his personal preference, which is the leadership factor, plays a huge, well, I would even say the determining role in China's relationship with, uh, with, with, with Russia. But what has happened since the beginning of the war in Ukraine, the two examples that I mentioned, the demotion of Lo Yucheng, who used to be the most popular candidate to replace Wang Yi, and now he's the number two of the national administration of radio. <laughs> still a, still a uh, vice ministerial position, so still very enviable. Um, 
and the, also the Chinese public statement that came from Xi himself that China opposes the use of nuclear weapons, which he also mentioned in his meeting with, uh, with President Biden, but he embedded in a, in a four jointly <coughs> instead of say it out loud clearly. But China's position is, re is, is very clear. It still will uh, pursue a close relationship with Russia because if you look at Li Jianxu's um, visit to Russia at the beginning of September and what he told, what he told the Duma and how the Russians leaked his talk to, the, uh, to YouTube, you have one there, um, you can see that China is still making an effort to engage Russia and to keep the cooperation going. But on the other hand, I think Xi Jinping's change of attitude through the, exa the, the examples that I mentioned also has an impact over how the policy community will, will make their assessment. So I'm not saying that China somehow will see Russia as a complete liability moving forward, but I do think that the Chinese are having a disillusionment about Russia and what it means for China's future strategy. Well, that was great. I don't know if I have terribly much to add on that. I would just say, I mean, I think, you know, in my engagements with Chinese academics or diplomats on this, on these questions, really, you know, before the invasion, but especially after it and the last nine months, um, it's been consistent that there's been an effort to convince, uh, you know, think tankers and others that they're talking to, um, that uh, China does not view itself as anywhere near uh, in an alliance with Russia. Uh, that you know, China has significant qualms about Russian actions, um, that there's frustration, um, especially earlier in the year when uh, the Biden administration was um, you know, talking about the potential for China to uh, deliver weapons uh, to Russia and, and engaging European partners uh, with that information. Uh, there was significant frustration about that uh, from the, the folks that I was talking to. And a real desire to kind of, you know, say, you know, do not think of us in this way. Understand that there's a real split, and you use that word, that continues to abide in the China-Russia relationship. Um, so I, you know, there, there's kind of some news made in the, in the last week that, you know, of Chinese officials um, or, you know, unnamed uh, Chinese diplomats or officials are talking about how, uh, you know, Xi Jinping uh, was, was unaware of, uh, of the Russian invasion um, and that, that Putin was going to do this in February. I, I, I don't know, I've, you've been, I've been hearing that for a while now. That to me is not, that's been the line. So uh, I don't necessarily believe it, but I don't think anything has changed in that regard. So I'd say that that's kind of what, and I agree with, with you and that I think it's, you know, that, that's kind of your line and your approach and your, your take. It's hard to de de differentiate what people actually think in the privacy of their own homes versus what, you know, they're going to say to, uh, to people like us um, in, in these engagements. But I think it's dependent on, on, their, on their positions, right? And so, and that happens uh, higher up the chain as well. As you mentioned, Li Jianxu used to be, you know, number three in China's system. Um, saying these things um, uh, to the Duma uh, in uh, just, uh, I think, a week or two ahead of the statement uh, that Putin made uh, at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization about understanding China's concerns, right? So I think it, it really goes to this point that, you know, China really is trying to shape the message depending on the audience that it's talking to. We see that, and this is not surprising, right? I mean, every, every country does this. but. Uh, when we look at what China's doing in, in Europe, when we look at what China's doing when it, when it engages with, with um, you know, uh, at a 1.5 or track 2 level uh, in the United States and elsewhere, I think it's very different personally than what um, is believed at the top and, what, and the valuation that continues to persist of Russia as a key strategic partner from Xi Jinping down. And, um, you know, I think the, the examples that Yun laid out in terms of the, the, s the slight shifting we might be seeing, to me, I put a little less value on those. Um, I don't particularly think that the shift on the nuclear threat language was that significant. I think, I mean, it, it is significant in the sense that yes, China has been very cautious in saying anything critical of Russia over the last nine months. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's, it's something. But you know, the language on you know, the approach to we can never fight a nuclear war is something that China says all the time. Um, and I think you know, we just saw Wang's meeting with Sergei Lavrov on Tuesday again, kind of twisting it around back again to saying we praise Russia for holding the same position that, uh, that we reaffirm that a nuclear war can never be fought and that, and that threats, threats can never be put out there. So um, I don't see that necessarily as indicating 
that there's some major shift that's going on from the top down in terms of the valuation of, of Russia, despite the fact that, as I said and as you said, Yun, um, you know, there's an understanding that, that Russia's war in Ukraine has not gone to plan, that it has not served China's interests in many ways, but I don't think that that um, means that uh, at, the, at the kind of fundamental level from Xi Jinping and those who are actually determining Chinese uh, foreign policy and strategic decision making, there hasn't been a change, I think, in, in the valuation of China as a really important strategic partner or whatever we put in the, in the proposition. Sure. So uh, I do have one more question for the two of you before I open it up to Q&A. I know I'm cutting into the Q&A time right now, but I think it's an important one. So if you noted the proposition that the two of them were asked to discuss, is actually a little different than the proposition that we asked you to all vote on, because the, what we asked them to discuss is Beijing's views, and what we asked you all to vote on is, is Russia a net strategic asset? So I did want also Dave and you to uh, weigh in on from your personal perspective, obviously as, as someone sitting in D.C., do you think Russia is actually a net strategic asset to China? And maybe I could add one other thing to that is, so if China were to dis start distancing itself from Russia, would, would China suddenly be able to improve its relations with Europe, with the United States, or would it not really change very much? So I know, a hard question I just posed and dropped on you, Dave, but I would l really love your thoughts, and then, you, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Yeah, I mean, this is a, 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 I'm glad you raised that because I noticed the difference and it's significant because um, we're talking about what Beijing views and we're also talking about um, the question of whether a strong relationship is important versus just the value of, of Russia as a strategic partner, which is something else we can potentially talk about because, and you touched on this a little bit, you can want to have a strong relationship with a country even if you think it's a shambles because <laughs> to go in the other way is inconceivable and I think that applies to how China sees Russia. Um, but I, I mean, I, Bonnie, I think that that, that's a hard question to answer because it's a hard, you know, when we think of, you know, we can't, we can't conceive of China's actions um, ever as those of a purely, you know, rationalist, political science-y type of rational actor um, in that kind of context. We can't do that to any state. But I think when we think about why, you know, Xi Jinping and the, and, and the Chinese Communist Party value Russia as a key strategic partner, it's because of the deep vulnerabilities and fears that I mentioned that kind of really permeate uh, the party state that were laid out uh, in, in, in the work report by Xi Jinping and have, have been laid out uh, previously. And this sense that the United States really is this principal adversary that will continue to be so for decades to come. Um, and I think going beyond, again, what if we're kind of taking an objective look at this and say, well, you know, it's a great power competition. China needs Russia. They see the United States as their competitor. Therefore, they're going to side with, with Russia. I think because of those similarities in the regimes um, between uh, Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, their deep fear of the fact that the United States not just wants to compete with, 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 with Russia, with China, but wants to fundamentally overthrow those regimes. And I think that that is a true, that is something that each leader actually believes. And when they talk about color revolutions, uh, they're talking about not just what the United States, they believe, has done to uh, undermine authoritarian governance uh, in their peripheries, but also with the ultimate goal of undermining their own regime's uh, control on power. Um, so I think that's why it's really important to understand that, that you know, uh, if, if it were, I guess, to answer your question, if, it, if we were looking at this from a purely, you know, what is, what is the value to a, you know, uh, a Chinese regime that, that was not as concerned about its own maintenance of power, then I think that absolutely that would change my take on the value of Russia as an enduring strategic partner. Um, but I still think I would fall, I still think I would fall on the yes side because, you know, if you look at where U.S.-China relations are going, um, it's hard to make a case that Xi Jinping should pull back uh, from Russia when in, in the current situation, they really don't have many other uh, partners to turn to. And as I laid out, as we both laid out, uh, Russia is, is really important across the defense, political, economic domains, even in its significantly weakened state. Thank you, Dave. Great answer. I'll see what I can add. Um, I guess I'll say a, a, a typical Washington policy analyst answer is it depends. Um, and it depends on a couple of things. I think it depends on, well, now we know that Russia doesn't have many options coming to international financing, international cooperation, economic opportunities, market. Um, but does that 
give China the control over the relationship, to what extent China can control Russia beha Russia's behavior, especially those behaviors that China will deem as damaging for China's national interest, right? So if China has more ability to, to, uh, to influence Russia's decision making, and Russia is seen as less of a troublemaker for China's grand strategy or external strategy, I think Russia will be seen as a net asset. It really depends on how much damage Russia will be, will be imposing on China. Uh, it also depends on what options that China believes it has. Currently, it doesn't see many options. That one, one, one permanent answer that you will get from the, uh, from, from the Chinese officials on this uh, pro-Russian neutrality or this uh, seeming neutrality, but really not neutrality position after the breaking of the, uh, the Ukraine war is that, well, by the end of the day, it's geopolitics, right? Well, the United States is still on our, is still on our throat. And just by that position, we see China, we see Russia as our friend. So that really comes to the, to the option question. But I would say that on the option question, the Chinese are also, remember what I've talked about in terms of China's pivot towards Europe. So Europe's preference is beginning to play a bigger role in China's approach to, to Russia at the same time. So what options we have, maybe we don't have the option of US not being hostile to China, uh, but maybe there is an option that Europeans preference and Europeans policy can be shaped. And that's another factor that I think that uh, influence, can be, uh, influence can be exerted. But uh, as long as China sees the United States as the most consequential national security threat, it's not gonna abandon Russia. But how close that relationship will be, that's a, that's a separate question. Great, thank you. Now let me open up the floor to questions. We'll start with questions in the room. I think I'd like to start with two at a time in the room at this point. So uh, I see two right here. Gil Rosman, uh, editor of the Asan Forum. I think this is a terrific presentation, very interesting exchange. And somehow I agree with both speakers, although there are some real differences. But I think what's somewhat missing is how tense Sino-Russian relations have been for much of the past 10 years. A cat and mouse game, give and take, uh, lots of, on both sides, lots of distrust and uncertainty, and how one of the reasons Russia may have gone into Ukraine was to try to get more equal relations with China. That this was, and the Chinese understand that Russia has been trying to figure out a way to overcome this, excuse me, the junior partnership effect. And so I'm wondering how you put this in some perspective of the Russians think the Chinese are terribly arrogant and they're very worried about what comes with Chinese dominance. And the Chinese uh, keep ignoring Russian interest. For instance, what they did in India was a real attack on the Russian notion of a greater European, a Eurasian partnership. Mm -hmm. uh, shocked the Russians uh, the, in 2020. So how do you put this in this context of history? Mm -hmm. Hello, my name is uh, Tova. I'm a Norwegian journalist. Um, I have a question. Uh, you haven't mentioned uh, the United Nations and the voting in the General Assembly over um, condemning uh, Russia's warfare in Ukraine. And China has abstained in both cases, and it has been viewed as kind of a rebuke to Russia that China hasn't aligned itself and voting with Russia in the, in the General Assembly and the Security Council. Um, how do you assess this? And regarding your shift in power between the two countries, can you also see that that will happen, for instance, in the Security Council, where China over the last 20 years, I would say, have been sort of uh, following the Russian lead? Can you see that shifting now and that we can ch see changes in pattern of voting, for instance, over the, the civil war in Syria? Great, thank you. Um, okay, sure. Yeah. I can try to try to ask or answer Professor Rosman's question. Um, so I, I mean, I, I think that it's a it's a fair point and it's a it's a good one to make to underscore how um, tense relations between China and Russia have remained, despite the fact that I would argue uh, over the last ten years and especially since 2014, I think you have seen a significant deepening of that relationship. 
uh, and we've already talked about this, you know, across the military, across the economic domains, as well as uh, in the multilateral domain and, and, and in regards to revising the global order. Um, I think that that's a reflection, as, as you know, and as many of you know, of the fact that, you know, there is no love lost between China and Russia, and there's obviously a history there of, of conflict and a history of racism and a history of fundamental, you know, cultural disconnect. Um, I would say, though, that I, I think actually, you know, a lot of these areas where, you know, we've tried to look for where might there be, um, you know, points of friction that fundamentally unravel the relationship and cause it to not deepen in the future, I've actually been, you know, struck by the reverse a little bit in the sense that they have been able to manage these differences, right? I mean, you have a China that is unquestionably becoming more influential, for instance, in, in Russia's you know, traditional sphere, if we have to use that term, in Central Asia, um, and trying to manage that. And as I mentioned, you know, in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, trying to not step on Russia's toes, even as China's particularly economic influence, but increasingly political influence that always comes with it, um, grows. Um, I think, you know, you've seen that, as you mentioned, India. I think that's a really interesting dynamic. Um, obviously, I'm sure Russia was not happy with, with the conflict that we've seen at the China-India uh, border and China's aggression there, but I think that similarly, um, the, despite the fact that Russia continues to have a very um, productive uh, defense, um, defense and, and military uh, equipment relationship with, with India, uh, that has seemed not to really fundamentally cause rifts in the relationship. You could talk about any number of issues, right? I mean, Russia's relationship with, with Vietnam, you could talk about the Arctic. All of these things that we've looked at and said, well, is that going to be a problem? They've managed to paper over it. They've managed to push past it. Um, they've managed to, you know, at least, at least in theory, tie up the Belt and Road Initiative with the Eurasian Economic Union. So I've been struck that, that um, despite all of the, the problems that we know exist between the two countries and the friction points, um, I think China has bent over backwards to try not to offend Russia, to try not to stick its nose in the fact that it is now very clearly the junior partner in the relationship. The question to me is going forward whether that obtains, whether that holds, and, and whether China is, as I mentioned in my remarks, going to try to push its advantage in, in certain areas when it determines that it really needs to in order to, to serve its strategic interests. I think that, I think that remains to be seen, but it's something to watch closely. I agree with David. I think on the issue of the, the divergence of their interests and the convergence of their interests, it has been a permanent theme of, of China-Russia relations, right? The question is which one is the main theme and the, uh, which one overwhelms well, which one. And I think currently, uh, especially under Xi, if you look at the, the year of 2014, has been defined a year of abnormal acceleration of China-Russia relations because of the U.S. pivot to Asia and also because of the, the Crimea crisis really brought them onto the same page. And since then, I think their determination has been convergence of their relationship is more important than the divergence of their relations. Um, yeah, they, well, they, they have this agreement on Arctic. Well, who should pay? Well, should China? Should China finance, for example, upgrade of the infrastructure along the Russian nor northern sea route without asking for equity? knowing that the commercial viability is probably not going to transpire in the next 20 years. Well, the Chinese are just not going to go for it. And on Taiwan, I think the Chinese also note very clearly that when Putin was asked a question about Taiwan, he said, oh, well, the Chinese can figure it out. They can use economic integration to achieve unification, which is not necessarily a satisfactory answer for, for China. And then on the issue of India, 2020, of course, was tense, but I think the Chinese will also talk about, well, back in 2017, when we were having the Doklam standoff for almost three months plus, Russia was watching the whole time. Did they even bother to, to put a word, to put a good word between China and India? So what kind of partner is that? So um, for, for each of this vein, I'm sure you can trace, track into the historical agony or the grievances, dissatisfactions from all sides. But it doesn't mean that they don't see the United States as a common threat and as the most overwhelming and the most definitive um, well, factor in their, in, their, in their relationship. So they're going to have frictions down the road, there's no doubt. But is the friction going to change the nature of their alignment? I think so far, I don't see that. I agree with David, I don't see that. On the UN question, I don't think the Chinese voting record at the UN Security Council is to support Russia. I think it's to support what China wants to achieve. So down the road, if they still share the same perspective, see the common interest, I think they're still going to vote, vote in the same, uh, on the same plate. So. Great, thank you. Uh We'll take one or two uh, questions from online. Brian? Yeah, so uh, I'll start with one uh, from Trey at Sandia National Labs, uh, which is that 
As the war in Ukraine has developed, we've also seen Iran support Russia in various ways, and this re we've seen that relationship grow. What are your views on greater China, Russia, and Iran trilateral cooperation in the future and its potential value for similar uh, reasons you already mentioned in your discussions? Okay. Any of you want to weigh in on this? Oh, well, maybe I'll try it first and, and you know, fix what I said. Um, <laughs> I, I think um, it's a good question. I feel like you know, the, the, we're watching closely, all of us, where the China-Iran um, relationship Goes, right? I think a lot was made of this 25-year uh, agreement uh, that they um, signed up to not that long ago, but uh, they, the devil remains in the details, and it's unclear exactly, um, you know, um, it's unclear exactly if, if there's going to be a lot made good on the kind of pledges uh, that are in that agreement. Um, the other factor that always, you know, complicates the Iran dynamic, of course, is China um, has um, much tighter relations, actually, with uh, with the GCC countries, the Gulf Cooperation Council countries, with Saudi, uh, and with those you know countries in in the region that are uh, not uh, friendly towards Iran, and trying to straddle that that balance um, is one that I think we, we know that that, that, that China uh, is going to face going forward. Thus far, they've seemingly managed uh, to do so, uh, but but as the relationships uh, shift, as China becomes more engaged and more influential in the Middle East, which is something we're seeing not just in the investment and economic domain, and certainly in the energy space, which is, of course, uh, what China cares about most uh, when, it, when it comes to the Middle East still. Um, I think it's also, there's also China getting more involved, potentially, uh, in, in the security domain. There's been talk about, about potential basing um, uh, for China in, in the region. So all of these dynamics, I think, are at play when we think about you know, where is the China-Iran relationship going to go? How much deeper is it going to get? The energy dynamic will continue to be there. Uh, China continues to want to play a uh, seemingly responsible, positive role on, on resumption of talks uh, around uh, Iran's nuclear program. Um, but I think, um, I think there are still significant limitations to it, and I think that we shouldn't expect you know, this kind of trilateral China-Russia-Iran dynamic uh, to, be, to be nearly as important as what we're talking about in terms of the China-Russia bilateral relationship going forward. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that all said, um, when we look at what China, Russia, and Iran are collectively doing in terms of trying to undermine democracies, Iran especially in its own region, but, but you know, China and Russia globally, as I, as I talked about a little earlier, that I think is, is something to fundamentally watch. And, and in this context of you know, the democracies versus autocracies construct that the Biden administration has put out there, watching where, where those relationships go and, and the threat that it poses to open societies uh, is, I think, another thing to watch. I don't have a lot to add. I'll just say that, well, if you look at the trilateral cooperation, uh, what is the substance so far, right? Mm -hmm. um, they have had, I think, uh, several joint naval exercises in the Black Sea area, and, yeah. but I'm having a difficult time trying to recall what other, uh, what other things are in there. <laughs> All three countries are in, the, um, in the, the, the Chinese track on Afghanistan, the mm -hmm. minister, four ministers meeting of Afghanistan's neighbors, um, but not a lot of cooperation, at least not trilateral ones, under that, under that framework. Uh, well, I think the Chinese are still looking whether the JCPOA is going to have any life um, left, which is, I believe, part of the reason why what they promised in the 25-year blueprint, um, a lot of it is not being implemented. So they're, they're on paper, they look great, but coming to a specific implementation plan at the timetable, I just don't see one. Uh, and last but not least, Xi Jinping's next visit apparently will be there's a planned visit to Saudi uh, China Arab summit that is supposed to happen before the end of this year, so we're still counting six weeks left. Um, so, so yeah, there is a balancing act, but I think the Chinese would pl place more importance on GCC uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the strategic alignment in the region. Great, thank you. Let's take another round of questions from in the room. So I see, okay, one, two, three, and then we'll uh, do another round in a second. Thank you so much. I'm Benny. I'm a student at Georgetown University. And I wanted to ask, in this discussion, we talked a lot about um, Russia either being a strategic asset for China. But I wanted to ask you, other than their Russia's role in you know, fighting Ukraine right now, what do you see can happen that can make Russia a strategic and a net liability for China in the near future? Thank you. 
Um, hello, thank you so much. My name is uh, Shreya. I'm a student at uh, George Washington University. Uh, my question is about what, uh, if any, specific U.S. policies you can think of that have pushed the China-Russia relationship and uh, pushed the two countries to be closer. And I had two specifics in mind. I was thinking of U.S. nuclear strategy, uh, particularly in the nuclear posture. We did not reevaluate the first use doctrine. And uh, secondly, sanctions. Do you think sanctions have played into China's hand as it helps countries to circumvent them in the case of North Korea or uh, Iran? Thank you so much. Thank you. My name is Emma and I'm a student at American University. Kissinger has expressed that Russia has the potential to become a Western ally to balance against growing Chinese power and has suggested that in the midst of the war in Ukraine, we should not lose sight of this potential long-term relationship. Do you believe that in the long term this partnership is possible and should that affect the way that the West is handling our response to Ukraine and the situation there? Thank you. Three very uh, different questions, and I know we probably won't have time to answer all three of them fully, so uh, maybe I'll turn to Yun first, whichever sure. ones you want to answer, and then Dave, since you've been going first, Dave, the last couple of rounds. Uh, I think coming to the liability questions, um, I have a difficult time to think that what Russia would do, but I think if Russia does decide to use nuclear weapons, it will put China in a, in a, in a very awkward situation, but not absolute liability, because China already said that, well, we oppose it, and if Russia goes ahead and uses it, then it will, the question will be, what next question is, what is China going to do about it? And presumably, if China really sticks to its position, it will have to support a certain level of sanctions, which it probably would not want to. So I think that is not turning Russia into China's complete liability, but it's going to uh, agonize China's position. On U.S. policy, like I mentioned, the year of 2014 is like a watershed year. Look at what happened in Crimea, what happened with the pivot to, to Asia. I think China and Russia have the shared common perspective coming to a long list of things. Domestic governance, international system, uh, democracy and human rights. So those shared perspectives with or without U.S. policy, I think, is going to, is going to stay. And it's not just U.S. policy, I feel, that this is, a, this, is a, this is a common perspective about liberal international order, right? Um, so that's, that goes back to the, the convergence question. Um, well, there are a lot of convergence between the two, two countries' national interests. And it's not necessarily because of what the U.S. does or does not do. Um, last, the, the, the strategic triangle, ah, wow, I think I always wonder what Kissinger is going to say next. I feel that, that for, for U.S., well, we have been debating about this question that how do we provide, uh, prevent a China-Russia collusion, right? Mm -hmm. And I always feel that question is so weird because we want, to, we want to punish China, we want to punish Russia, we also want them not to work together. So that's like, we also want a unicorn. Um, <laughs> So it's, 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 I think we have made a very clear choice that we're not going to pick one over the other. For the time being, we're going to, we're going to take both of them all. Um, but there are specific implications, which I will leave today. <laughs> <laughs> I think you covered all of that very well. I, I think I would just add on the, the net liability. It's very hard to, um, to kind of think through what would make Russia such a net liability that that would, that would change um, Beijing's view of Russia as a strategic asset. And, I, and as I kind of hinted at earlier, I think this language that we had in our proposition about um, a strong relationship with Russia as a net asset, I think even if um, you know, China were to begin to view Russia as a diminished strategic value for any number of reasons, it would still be true that China's leaders would still need to have a strong relationship with the country um, because what's the alternative, right? I mean, if you, I don't see how China, when you look at China's ge unfortunate geography and you look at all the problems it has around its periphery, and we've already talked about this a little bit, I mean, the, the value of having a uh, fairly quiet 4,000 kilometer border with Russia uh, ever since they settled their dispute uh, like two decades ago um, really can't be overstated. So. Um, I really can't uh, foresee a, a situation where Russia, you know, becomes a liability, but uh, regardless, uh, China decides, well, it's, it's now in our interest to, to pull away and to have a weak or an even poor relationship with Russia. I mean, imagine the situation in, in which, you know, you have a, a Russia that 
um, is um, either you know, destabilized, which could be a potential result of China having a weak relationship with Russia because of how important the relationship is to Russia now. Uh, imagine a Russia that is more uh, aligned with the United States or at the very least less friendly um, to, to China um, and, and what that would mean in terms of um, Washington's ability potentially to focus more of its energy even uh, on, on China's rise. Oh, thanks. Um, so, so I think, you know, regardless of, of, of how much of a liability Russia becomes, um, and we can, I mean, I guess we could posit, you know, nuclear use by Russia. Um, we could posit, uh, you know, Putin falling from power and what that could mean. But I think in most cases, even in, in a situation where Russia is of less value, it's still important for China to have that strong relationship. Um, and then um, just on the policies, I agree with you on what, when, uh, what's push China and Russia relations closer. I mean, you can certainly look at, obviously, from the Russia side, all the sanctions uh, since 2014, but things were already kind of trending in this direction, really, since the, uh, since the end of the Cold War, and then arguably, uh, especially um, after, uh, you know, 2001, 2002. Um, I think, you know, if you look at, um, obviously, where the U.S.-China relationship has gone, um, partly, yes, uh, you know, U.S. actions. We can't think of this as a one-way street. Uh, the, the pivot to Asia, U.S. focus uh, more on, on the South China Sea, U.S. focus on our allies there, uh, arguably more focus on Taiwan. But obviously under Xi Jinping, we've seen a, a more uh, aggressive approach uh, in East Asia. Um, and I think that, that this has been a kind of dynamic, a spiraling dynamic between the U.S. and China, and that has caused um, poor relations with the United States uh, for both China and Russia, and that, as we've discussed, necessarily draws China and Russia um, closer together. I don't necessarily think it's nuclear strategy or the no first use policy, which you know, has been there um, for a long time. So uh, I think it's, it's more these dynamics that for both of these countries, uh, they really are being pushed together because the relationship with the United States um, for bilateral reasons uh, has gotten so bad. Thank you. So I know um, we are probably we're near the end of our uh, time here, and I know we're keeping you all from your afternoon and your lunch. But I do want to do before we uh, we wrap up the session. I do want to do the voting again. So um, again, if you can, uh, can you please vote the vo vo voting slide? That's right. Uh, so you can vote online, or you can vote via a text message. Um, so for voting via text message, please text 22333 with your views. If you t after you do that, uh, A is for agree. Oh, B, B is for disagree. Uh, so let's just wait a couple of minutes. But um, this is an almost reversal of what we saw at the beginning of the day. <laughs> Okay, so with that, let me just offer any final closing thoughts from both uh, or either of our panelists, if you have any, um, after seeing the polls and, and as we're wrapping things up. I'm not, I said you <laughs> Okay. <laughs> we argued the same thing, I think. And that's why, and that's why it shifted. Um, no, I, I mean, I think that obviously what this means, um, and I, I think is, and we touched on this a little bit earlier, is that the United States and our allies need to um, and I think we're doing this now increasingly uh, at, in, the, at, in Washington here, at, at NATO and other places, uh, and with our allies in East Asia, um, thinking through the implications of a longstanding, uh, deep, uh, and deepening relationship between China and Russia strategically, uh, and needing to think through the implications of that uh, in various uh, contingencies and scenarios, what that means um, for the future of the, the, the liberal global order, uh, and all of the interests and values that, that we and our allies care about. I think um, there, you know, there's, it's, I think, not a bad thing to continue to think of ways in which we might um, try to, you know, create wedges between China and Russia, but I think for the most part, uh, that's going to be very difficult to achieve, and we need to focus our energy on planning for and, and thinking through um, how to deal with the significant implications of the fact that these countries are going to be partners for the long haul. Um, I agree. <laughs> um, for the Chinese, there is a saying about China-Russia relations. In Chinese, it's, uh, it is uh, China and Russia can only share miseries, but not happiness. <laughs> so that really says a lot, right? Oh. Um, so I think moving forward with the strategic competition between U.S. and China and with Russia coming out of this war in, uh, war in Ukraine in, um, in, in, in whichever form, um, I think 
this relationship is going to grow. It is going to grow because the misery for both will only increase down the road, right? Um, so in that sense, what would be more interesting is to look at not only how they cooperate, but also how they differ. The issue that, um, that Gil just raised, the divergence of their relations. I think there are a couple of things that we will be watching, um, like for example, what is going to happen to the Yamal 2 project, now that Japan has already pulled out. So Russia will have no uh, alternative source to really diversify their portfolio. So will they be willing to give it to China? Will they be keeping it? Is Russia willing to open more critical infrastructure to China in the Russian high north, for example? Central Asia, I think, is a different question. But if you look at what happened with Kazakhstan earlier this year and the Russians sending peacekeepers from CSTO, ignoring the Chinese proposal to, to have a discussion and potential actions by the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, I think there are going to be interesting, interesting dynamics to emerge. Not that these dynamics are going to outweigh the convergence of their, of their, of their interests, but it does offer a very interesting case study as for the, uh, the long-term trajectory of China-Russia relations. Again, if you think about what Deng Xiaoping said back in the 1980s, quoting the wise man, <laughs> in the 1980s, Deng Xiaoping once said, there are only two countries historically inflicted the most damage on China ever. One is Japan during World War II, the other one is Russia. So when the Chinese look at the relationship with Russia, the historical factor is always going to be there. Russia taking 1.5 million square kilometers of Chinese territory, and Russia supporting of the independence of Mongolia. So in the Chinese book, the, the total territory that Russia took from China, or what caused China to lose, is more than 4.5 million square kilometers, and that's not a small number. Which is why I feel that if you look at the, the long-term trajectory, there are plenty of historical grievances uh, embedded in there. So definitely interesting to watch. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, I want to um, give a round of applause for both David Yin <laughs> for their very excellent remarks. And I also want to give a round of applause for everyone who stayed with you, thank, with us. Thank you very much for staying with us for half a day. Um, we really appreciate this opportunity, in-person opportunity, as well as virtual opportunity to engage with the community. And I just want to note that this is, again, only the first event of our China Power Conference series. We will have a next virtual event, I believe, January 24th, focusing on the economic dimensions of the relationship. And we hope to also have a debate on the nuclear dimensions of the relationship. So stay tuned, and we will be reaching out to you all again. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.